हेलो गौरव दा यस हेलो ओके गुड आफ्टरनून एवरीवन एक्चुअली वी आर हैविंग सम टेक्निकल इश्यूज सो काइंडली वेट फॉर सम टाइम आई होप इट विल बी रिजॉल्व वेरी सून जस्ट बी पेशेंट एंड वेट फॉर सम टाइम yeah already our principal sir has joined us okay then uh, sir can you hear me yes yes okay sir then we can proceed now yeah okay okay a very good afternoon to all of you uh, welcome to this one day international webinar on body and literature organized by the department of english and the iqsc kk dash college kolkata uh, we are extremely happy uh, to have our two eminent speakers with us dr orko chattopadhyay and dr shori dhottacharya uh, on behalf of our department and college i heartily welcome them uh at the very beginning i just uh, want to request to all our uh, respected participants uh, just to mute their audio and disable their video too uh, okay now uh, before uh, going further uh, i must extend our gratitude to our honorable principal sir dr ramkrishna prasad chakraborty uh, he has always been with us and without his uh, inspiration i must say that this webinar uh, couldn't have been taken place uh, so now may i request to our honorable principal to say a few words sir over to you sir very good evening to everybody ladies and gentlemen i am very proud that our department of english has arranged an all webinar on body and literature and two eminent speaker in this what's uh, webinar are today as present here they are fortunate for them the distinguished speaker we are here to hear from them and thank you honorable speakers and hearty you welcome all participant in the webinar webinar from our state national and from outside our country too so thank you no more from me we are here to hear from our distinguished speaker thank you thank you animesh for organizing this type of webinar along with your department and the iqsc overall the team kkdc thank you thank you sir thank you for your kind word uh, now let me tell you very briefly that today's webinar uh, on body and literature actually runs deeper than the mere representation of body in literature uh, actually we take both this phenomenon as unique distinct but interconnected to each other and uh, we hope that our purpose today will be served if we can look at them into the larger domain of history politics uh, and philosophy as well our uh, first speaker is dr orko chotopadhyay uh, he would be talking on corporeality and death uh, literary and philosophical reflections let me tell you very briefly about uh, orko da as we uh, fondly call him uh, orko chotopadhyay is assistant professor of uh, literary studies in the department of humanities and social sciences at iit gandhinagar india he is a ba ma mphil in english literature from presidency college and jadavpur university india he has written his mphil thesis on samuel beckett and alan badiou 
and has finished his PhD from Western Sydney University on Beckett and Lacanian's psychoanalysis. He has been published in books like Delusion Beckett, Knots, Post-Lacanian Psychoanalysis Literature and Film, Gerald Marmel, Another World in This One, etc. And journals such as Textual Practice, Interventions, Samuel Beckett Today, Psychoanalysis, Culture and Society, Sound Studies, and the Herald Pinter Review as well. He has co-edited the book, Samuel Beckett, and the Encounter of Philosophy and Literature, and has guest uh, edited the SBTA issue on Samuel Beckett and the Extension of the Mind. Uh, Dr. Akur Chattopadhyay is the chief editor of the online literary journal called Shongla. His first monograph, Beckett, Loco, and the Mathematical Writing of the Real has been published by Bloomsbury in 2019. He is currently finishing co-editing a volume on Novarun Bhattacharya for Bloomsbury India, Settle for 2020, and working uh, on another volume as well on Badu and uh, Modernism. So over to you, Akur. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you so much for that kind introduction, Animesh, and this invitation. Uh, thank you to uh, Professor Chakraborty, uh, the principal, uh, for coming and raising this occasion. Uh, before we go into the, the subject matter, uh, let me tell you it's interesting to uh, share the platform with my very old friend, Chorit, who's going to talk after me. And initially, the order... Uh, was planned different, but I think in a certain sense, the two talks will talk to one another. Uh, and Shorit will be talking specifically about Bengali literature, post-colonial Bengali literature, and the question of hunger, which is a particular question around corporeality. And he would be going into the socio-historical and political nitty-gritties of that question. Uh, what I would be doing, and that's why I think this works better as a first presentation, is something more along the lines of a reflective presentation, where I will not be making one posited argument about bodies in literature, but I'll try and throw open this field where there are multiple ways of reading the question of corporeality in literature. And I will specifically focus on the relation between body and death. Uh, while I will not be talking directly about the current situation, I believe uh, with the virus situation, an extremely stressful situation that way that we all find ourselves in, there would be some resonances with the anxieties and the fears, which are very bodily, right? The, the, the fear of mortality, the anxieties around... Uh, you know, what happens to our near and dear ones, our friends, our family members in this pandemic situation. I mean, that was one of the prompts behind my choice of the subject, corporeality and death. Without further ado, let me first introduce uh, the idea. So it's interesting when we say corporeality, the word corporeality contains the word reality in itself. And that's an interesting suggestion because there is a certain connection in that uh, word, in that signifier, corporeality. Uh, there is a connection between reality and the body. Okay. Body and reality. Uh, to move a step further from there, we could say corporeality is about the construction of reality through our bodies. We make meaning in the world through our bodies. Body is a unit of human meaning. Uh, through movement, through speech, which again comes from the body, through gestures, body language, what is typically called body language, through verbal and nonverbal communicational means, we create a sense of reality. So reality is constructed by the body. This is a suggestion uh, nestling in that signifier, corporeality. Now, I'll be talking about the experience of death in relation to body and how do we bodily register the experience of death, which already opens up 
quite a complicated philosophical problem because experience of death is something that we cannot feel in our own bodies. It's a very difficult feeling, first of all, and it's not something that we can feel very easily. In fact, if we take experience of death and death as the sort of totality, we do not have the experience of our own death. I'll complicate each of these questions through particular philosophical traditions, and we'll also talk about literature, uh, possibly more towards the latter half of this talk. But the, the, the connection I'm trying to make between corporeality or the corporeal construction of reality and death is that it's very difficult to have an experience of death at the level of corporeality. What we have is the experience of the other's death. We see other people dying. Unfortunately, we are living in a situation now where we are increasingly seeing people dying and people have been dying, of course, for a number of months. But now we have reached a stage with this uh, situation where even within our circle of knowledge, let's say circle of acquaintances, we are encountering these very unfortunate uh, you know, intimations of, of people passing away. So it's very sad and difficult and stressful times. One of the reasons why I thought we, we, we could talk about these things in an academic way, uh, sometimes these things also create a certain kind of subjective release. But, uh, and, and of course, I'm, I'm coming at it from uh, my own background in psychoanalytic literary studies and also a clinical training in psychoanalysis that I've taken during my doctoral years in Australia. But very briefly, to come back to and, and, and to continue to open up this question, uh, there's a famous moment in Martin Heidegger's uh, great philosophical book, Being and Time. And uh, let me give you the exact reference. Uh, this is the section in Being and Time that is titled The Possibility of Experiencing the Death of Others and the possibility of getting a whole Dasein into our grasp. I'll talk about this particular uh, section in Heidegger's book, Being in Time, to open up this question. Heidegger's question is pretty simple at some level. Uh, the question is, we cannot experience our own deaths, and in order to create a, a, a theory of our being, we need a theory of death. So in this book, as most of you would be knowing, Heidegger is constructing his ontology. Ontology, which is uh, traditionally considered the first philosophical tradition, so to speak. Ontology is the study of being. And in this case, he is primarily talking about human beings, though there are uh, conceptualizations of the non-human animal in Heidegger. But I'm going to stick to one particular question in this ontological study of being, where Heidegger is interested in the question of death, because death is something that is inextricably attached to our being in the world. Without a theory of death, there cannot be a complete theory of what he calls Dasein. Dasein is Heidegger's word for being. Now, in this particular section, the question that he opens up is at some level very simple and at another level uh, extremely profound and complicated. How do we have an experience of death? Because we cannot experience death in our bodies. When we die, that's the moment of the final disembodiment, when there is no experience of the felt body or the, the body that we can sense, the body that we can feel comes to an end. So there is no subjective registration of death in terms of our own deaths. What we see is the death of the other. Now, this is Heidegger's question. Is this death of the other significant enough or powerful enough, let's say, strong enough to give us an idea of our own death as an ontological principle? This is Heidegger's question, and he sort of towards an answer in the negative that it's not as 
uh, ontologically, you know, let's say powerful as the death of the self. And the death of the self remains impossible to experience in our bodies. Now, we have to make a distinction here, and I'll, I'll invoke two uh, continental philosophers who, in a way, take after Heidegger, but in very different ways. One is uh, Maurice Blachau, uh, the French philosopher Maurice Blachau. Now, Blachau famously is the thinker of the neuter, what is called the neuter or the neutral sometimes in the English translation. Uh, and, and he's someone who comes up with this particular post Heideggerian ontology of the neuter. Now, what is this neuter? What is this it? Uh, Blachau, along with another uh, French philosopher, George Bataille, is someone extremely interested in death, the process of death, uh, as well as the experience of death. Uh, but Blachau, as well as uh, another philosopher I'll mention right now, Gilles Deluge, another French philosopher who builds off quite a bit from Blachau, they both have this very interesting idea, and Deluge takes it up from Blachau, that there is, again, a difference between dying and death. You know, as, as some of you might have already sort of been thinking, we do have an experience of dying. Everyone has an experience of time, or possibly everyone can have an experience of time. I mean, the, the most banal example of that would be someone diagnosed with a terminal disease. So we do have a corporeal registration of the feeling that we are dying. At least it's possible. But what is not possible is a total experience of death. So there is a distinction both Blachau and Deluge make between dying and death. Let's also have that in our mind as an important distinction, dying and death. What is important here, and that's where I would sort of come in with the question of corporeality, uh, what is interesting is that even though Blachau, uh, particularly speaking Blachau, talks about death, we don't have a very substantial discourse of corporeal death in Blachau. So Blachau doesn't really talk about the physical experience of dying. He talks more about death as a concept. And what does death mean, for example, in relation to time? Blachau's famous figuration is death as this impossible future. Death is an impossible future because it's always in the future. And when it gets realized in the form of a present, we are not there to experience that present if it is our own death. Right? It's actually quite commonsensical at that level. Death opens up a future which never becomes a present for the dying person. It does become a present for others. You know? The mourners, for example, are those who survive the dead. Now, let me install here the question of the corpse, which is what I will be talking about in most of this uh, talk. The question of the corpse. The corpse as a corporeal materialization of dead, of the dead, of, of death as an experience. So it's very interesting if we think of the question of the corpse in this way, uh, we find that in the same section I mentioned uh, in Heidegger's Being and Time, there is a reference to the corpse. Let me briefly read that passage. Uh, this is Heidegger, Being and Time, uh, and this is a section on the death of the other, the, the death of others. However, in this way, and this is Heidegger I'm quoting now, however, in this way, interpreting the changeover from Dasein uh, to being just present at hand and no more, the phenomenal content is missed. Inasmuch as in the entity which still remains, we are not presented with a mere corporeal thing. From a theoretical point of view, even the corpse, so let's underline the sentence, from a theoretical point of view, even the corpse, which is present at hand, is still a possible object for the student, student of pathological anatomy, whose understanding tends to be oriented to the idea of life. 
This something which is just present at hand and no more is more than a lifeless material thing. In it, we encounter something unalive which has lost its life. A very intriguing passage, one must say in Heidegger, where he's reflecting on the corpse as an object. Now, a couple of points about this passage. It's a dense passage. Uh, so he's at this point in his theorization of being where he's transitioning from being just present at hand, the being that is present, to the being that is no more, the dead being, right? When the being passes away, that's the moment of death. Now, his point about the corpse, the first point he makes about the corpse is that it's a, it's a fairly worldly point. A corpse is often used by students to understand human anatomy. So the corpse as an object is brought back into the loop of life. It becomes an object of medical investigation. And I'll, I'll briefly touch upon this very soon, how medical humanities has become one very important way of approaching the body in literature. So what we see here is this moment when, when Heidegger says that it is studied, the corpse is studied as an object by students of pathological anatomy. But the important point is, it's not necessarily just a dead object because it is put back into the loop of human meaning. It is put back into the idea of life, as, as, as Heidegger says. It is reoriented into the idea of life. But let's dwell on the last sentence of the passage I just read. Let me read it again. This something, so this something is the corpse, which is just present at hand and no more, is more than a lifeless material thing. So the corpse is not an object. The corpse is something more than an object, Heidegger seems to suggest. In it, we encounter something unalive, which has lost its life. This word unalive is very interesting. Uh, it's an object which was once alive, right? The corpse is not the inanimate. The corpse is an object that was once alive, but not alive anymore. So it's very interesting that we use the same word body. We use the word human body for anyone who's alive. And then when the person dies, we often call the person a body. We are going to pick up the body, right? So there's this transition from a human subject to a material object. But the important point Heidegger is making here is that a dead body, a corpse, is not like a pen, for example. It's, it's, it's not like the inanimate object which never had life. So this object is unalive, which means it was once alive. So the word unalive registers the fact that the corpse is not just an inanimate object like any other lifeless matter. Now, it's interesting that if we go and, and try and see how literature represents the figure of the corpse, let me very briefly mention a very interesting work that came out uh, recently. There's a book that some of you, if you're interested, you could read called The Modernist Corpse. It's a post-human study of the figure of the dead body in especially Anglo-American modernist texts like Faulkner's and, and Edgar Allan Poe's. Some of you might remember that famous story of Edgar Allan Poe's called The, fact in the, the Facts in the Case of Valdemar. So Valdemar is a character who is hypnotized by his friend at the moment of death. And we have this sort of frozen body which unfreezes in the spectacular, grotesque final moment of the story. And, you know, the body entirely dissolves because this body had already turned into carrier. But because of hypnotism, it was held along that sort of spell of magic, sort of held it in that position of one body. But the moment the hypnotism was taken back or the hypnotic spell was withdrawn by the narrator, Valdemar's body 
turned into this carrier. And it's very interesting how Poe describes this last moment in the story. If you want to go back to the story and read the last line, you would see that this matter, this body, which is now turned into some putrefying flesh, is not even nameable. Language fails to find a name for this object. Carrion is the word that falls short. We don't know what this grotesque thing is. So that's again a moment where we have the body. Again, uh, in Faulkner's As I Lay Dying, there's that famous uh, you know, journey to bury the dead. And that's what forms the entire novel. So this particular book, The Modernist Corpse, talks about the figure of the corpse in modernist literature from a post-human point of view. And it's very interesting because in post-humanism, we have generally seen readings of the human subject in relation to various non-human things, including objects or things in the world, the animal, the non-human animal, I mean. But the, the scope of this book is that it expands this post-human investigation of the human body in relation to the corpse, which is another figure of the other, another figure of this non-human other. The human body turns into a corpse, and yet the corpse is not exactly the human body that was alive. In fact, let's ask a question which is often asked in studies on mourning. Uh, those who survive the dead often ask this question when they see uh, a dear departed for the last time in the form of a corpse before the burial or the cremation. For some, it is still their, you know, mother or their father or their, you know, uh, grandmother or their whoever, the family member. For others, it's not their family member. For others, it's not their friend. For others, it's just an object. This is a sort of empirical ethnographic work that, you know, reveals this, this kind of, you know, dichotomy in the way in which culturally we perceive the corpse. We perceive the corpse in very different ways. For someone, the corpse is the last time one sees one's friend. For another person, the corpse is not that friend. The corpse is a mere thing. So as you can understand here, I'm partially questioning through lived experience the point that Heidegger is making philosophically. Whether or not the corpse is a thing uh, is, is, is something under question. Let's put it under some sort of a suspension. Let me come back after this initial elaboration on this question of the body as a content of representation in literature. And to approach this question from a very elementary point, let's also mark the fact that a literary text is a body. A literary text is a corpus. Corpus is the word we often use, right? And it has the same etymological origin as body or corpse. There's a body of language. Uh, Greek, uh, ancient Greek philosophy, especially the cynics, had this idea of the signatum uh, by which they talked about the body of language. So language uh, from Greek antiquity in philosophy has been considered as a body. Language as a body relates to the literary text as a linguistic object, which is also a body. So there's a body of the literary text, and then there's a, there's a question of body as a semantic unit in literature, in theatre, for example. Theatre is, is an interesting example where we literally have the body as a cipher on stage. Each body, each human body, is like a cipher on the stage space. Now, if body is a semantic unit, how can corpse become a semantic unit? Corpse is a paradoxical unit of meaning in literature. Why do I say paradoxical? Because when a human being has died and become a corpse, the meaning of their life has in a way ceased. The corpse only has the history of a meaning, the past of human meaning. It does not quite have the present of a dynamic meaning, right? a meaning that is unfolding. Once a person is dead, there is no meaning in that person's life 
which can still unfold. Yes, there is a history of meaning that is not erased for sure in the figure of the corpse. But let's think about the figure of the corpse in, in, in cultural texts, in literature as well. I mean, uh, at least uh, in, in my memory, as someone growing up in the 90s, a very interesting and a hilarious uh, uh, sort of figuration of the corpse that I remember is from the film Jane Bhido Yaru. In Jane Bhido Yaru, we have this sort of comic utilization of a corpse. And we see this in a lot of Italian theater as well. So corpse has had a comic figure, has, has had a sort of comic purchase. So let's think of the corpse as a representational content in literature, which is also dictated by the genre of the text. You know, it, it depends partially on the genre of the text. As you know, Jane Vido Yaro is a satirical social political comedy, and the corpse has a very satirical role to play in that film. You know, in horror stories, we typically have this figure of the corpse that comes alive, right? The unalive comes alive, the, the zombification of the body. Uh, I'm not really going to talk about the horror modulations of the corpse, partially because they're somewhat self-evident. I'm going to talk about texts where the corpse features in relation to some of the questions I've opened up. The question of mourning, the question of who is alive and who is dead? How does the mourner feel about the different conditionalities of his or her own body and the body of the dead? Because the body of the mourner is an alive body, to put it like that. Whereas the body of the corpse is unalive. How does one make this distinction? Let me go to a famous short story, which uh, I suppose most of you would have already read. But I'll pick out one particular moment from that short story. It's D.H. Lawrence's 1909 short story, The Odor, Odor of Chrysanthemums. Odor of Chrysanthemums. Uh, again, I'm not going to read the whole story, but very briefly, it's about this uh, mine worker who dies in a cave-in and his body is brought back to his family members and his wife and his mother, they are washing the body. They are, uh, you know, opening the clothes and washing the naked body. This constitutes the moment I want to talk about. Uh, the figure of the corpse, as, as obviously you understand, features in this very important moment in the story. So this is Elizabeth, the wife, washing the corpse of her husband. I'm going to read two parts, one small one and one slightly longer passage. Uh, please bear with me. The first one, the shorter passage, is this. But she had to draw away again. He was dead and her living flesh had no place against his. A very telling observation by D. H. Lawrence, the famous modernist writer who was interested in uh, instincts and bodies and sexuality and the, the, the question, the psychoanalytic question of death. Uh, so in this story, and this is an early story, much before Lawrence becomes a, a, a well-known writer from 1909, again, let me read that second uh, sentence that I read there. He was dead, so this is the husband, and her living flesh had no place against his. So this is an important point I would like to sort of, again, impinge upon, that there is a certain incompatibility between the body of the one who's alive and the body of the one who's dead. And there's almost a revulsion of that dead body as a corpse, even though this is someone, you know, as close to the survivor as the husband. Yeah. So there's some incompatibility, some revulsion in the living flesh, which has no place against the dead flesh, the dead flesh of the husband. Now, with this incompatibility in mind, let me read the second and slightly longer passage. Uh, please bear with me. In fear and shame, she looked at his naked body that she had known falsely. And he was the father of her children. Her soul was torn from her body and stood apart. She looked at his naked body and was ashamed as if she had denied it. After all, it was itself. It seemed awful to her. 
She looked at his face and she turned her own face to the wall for his look was other than hers. His way was not her way. She had denied him what he was. She saw it now. She had refused him as himself and this had been her life and his life. She was grateful to death which restored the truth and she knew she was not dead. A wonderfully complex and profound passage. Uh, it would take more than a month to decipher this passage in detail. Let me just uh, try and do some injustice here uh, to the passage. Uh, so first and foremost, we have this very strong idea of the incompatibility of two bodies, the body of the person who's alive and the dead body, the corpse. But at the same time, let's also see how the body evokes a certain kind of meaning. A deeply affective, amorous, and, and, and partially sentimental, perhaps, meaning. There's also a certain association in this entire story uh, where we are talking about how the wife, you know, sees this other body in her husband. This is someone who has made love to the same body while this body was alive. But now this body looks very different. It feels very different. And what perhaps strikes us the most in this passage is how this question of defamiliarization is highlighted. There's a denial. So the wife thinks, Elizabeth thinks here, that somehow she has denied the corporeality of her husband's body as long as he was alive. It's only now that she has been able to understand his corporeality because he has now turned into a corpse. So again, that, that wonderful sentence, she looked at his naked body and was ashamed as if she had denied it. This shame of denial, shame, a very strong affect, and denial, again, a very, a very, a very strong moment where the, the husband's body is defamiliarized into an object and she's denying that object. Again, I mean, we have the same idea here. Uh, let me read another sentence. She had denied him what he was. She saw it now. So death teaches this lesson, as it were. And we also have this very interesting, slightly cryptic sentence where uh, Lawrence goes, after all, it was itself. What is this it, this Blachoian neutral object, the corpse? The corpse is itself. The corpse does not have any effusive meaning to it, unlike the, the, the body that is animated with life. For, for example, we are all bodies animated with life. As I'm speaking, I'm making all these hand gestures, right? These movements are missing in a corpse. A corpse does not have the sign of life. And culturally, even though it's not entirely true biologically, but culturally, movement is considered the trace of life in the human body. Let me take that as a point of departure and move to another text, another literary text from a somewhat similar modernist but late modernist tradition. This is a short story written by Samuel Beckett in 1980. And this story titled One Evening was also a first draft or one of the initial drafts of his novella, Il Seen Il Sink, Malvu Maldit. So in this short story, one evening, we have this old woman who is suddenly uh, in a moment where she discovers this corpse, this dead body. But again, it's, it's you know, in typical Beckettian style, we don't quite know whether it's a dead body. Let me read the opening lines. This is the story called One Evening by Samuel Beckett. He was found lying on the ground. No one had missed him. No one was looking for him. An old woman found him, to put it vaguely. So it's a, it's a very brief story where we realize that this, this, this man who's lying prostrate on the ground and discovered by this old woman, uh, we don't know for sure whether this man is dead. But the man does not have a subjective identity in the story. He's treated as this corporeal object, a body, right? Uh, 
again, there's a moment, uh, let me read another part, were a third party to chance that way, theirs were the only bodies he would see. First, that of the old woman standing, then on drawing near, it lying on the ground. So again, that neutral pronoun, it lying on the ground. So there's a wonderful sort of geometry here, the, the verticality of the body that is alive and the, the horizontality of the body that is dead. Now, we don't know whether there is any relation between this old woman and this corpse. She chances upon this corpse. But halfway through the story, there's a very interesting change of narrative tense. The time changes. Halfway through the story, the, the time of narration changes and Beckett switches from a past tense to a present tense. To quote, in the present to conclude. In the present to conclude. That's the sentence which signals this shift of the tense, the, the shift of narrative time. The rest of the short story is in the present tense. Now, let me read this part. She's wearing, note the tense, it's present now, right? She's wearing the black she took on when widowed young. It is to reflower the grave she strays in search of the flowers he had loved. So it's only after this temporal shift from the past to the present that we realize uh, that this woman has been widowed young. And she's going out now, uh, walking through the grass field to reach her long dead husband's grave, to flower his grave. So she's going out to flower the grave of her husband and she chances upon this dead body, seemingly at least the dead body of a completely unknown person who is missed by nobody, right? No one had missed him. No one was looking for him. That's the line that repeats itself throughout the story. Now, again, the interesting point is and that's where the story ends. It does not have a conclusion, so to speak. But the, the point I want to dwell upon is this shift of tense. And what happens when the story changes from the past to the present? We have this crucial new piece of information that the woman is actually visiting her husband's grave. And she chances upon another body just there, lying there inert on the grass field. We almost wonder whether this is a reenactment of her husband's grave. And this is something that happened a long time back, as in her husband died a long time back. So it's interesting how the, the, the figure of the grave from the past returns in the second half of the story after this, you know, tense shift. And we have this very uncanny doubling of the husband's grave in the form of this encountered corpse, the corpse that is encountered, you know, uh, by chance. And the story, again, underlines this point about chance, the corpse that is in, encountered, you know, one fine month. Uh, I'm sorry about these jumps, but uh, that's the whole purpose of this paper where I'm going to jump and I'm going to talk about multiple uh, words uh, in a single breath. Uh, let us briefly go and, and talk about a more contemporary short story. This is uh, an American, a contemporary American short story writer, Brian Evenson, uh, who is particularly famous for his horror and science fiction stories. Though I said I will not go into horror, and it's not exactly a horror story, uh, at least not in a ghost or zombie sense, though there are those elements in the story. It's a story from his, uh, one of his recent collections uh, called A Collapse of the Horses. And this particular story, A Collapse of Horses, uh, this is the collection of the story. The story is titled Any Corpse, Any Corpse. Now, let me very briefly tell you what the story is all about, and then I'll you know, focus on one particular question, the question of language. So in the story, we have this sort of uh, an end of the world situation. Uh, and in this end of the world situation, it seems like there are isolated human beings who live in their respective little shelters, 
And there are these scavengers, they're being called scavengers. There are these scavengers who, you know, supply them with meat. But there isn't a lot of availability for a whole body. And we're talking about a cannibalistic society here, a society that eats human flesh. Human means eating human flesh. So in this cannibalistic society, every morning there's a rain of meat on the cornfield. Somebody does that. That's almost part of a governmental process, it seems. That's how the government feeds the people. There's a rain of meat. But there is no whole body. So the first half of the story is about this lady who wants to have a whole body and approaches the scavengers in their caves who might give her a body. Now, when she says she wants a body, not meat, but a whole body, uh, they don't quite understand. These scavengers are not human beings. They are robotic creatures. It's not very clear in the story precisely what kind of uh, people they are. They're, it's not very uh, clearly stated anywhere, but these are robotic figures. Now, when the lady says, uh, I want a corpse, they ask this question in the form of uh, like a machine query. She says, uh, I want a corpse, and they say, any corpse? So that's the question they ask. Any corpse? And she says, yes. The scavenger says, freshly dead? She says, yes. Again, there's a second query, the same query. Any corpse? And she says, correct. What they do after this is they take her out of the cave and kill her. So she becomes the corpse because it's any corpse. So let's dwell on this, you know, again, very intriguing qualifier, any. Any before the noun corpse. Any is, a, is an interesting qualifier, an interesting adjective, because any, unlike every, refers to anyone in a, in a set, anyone in a collective. When we say everyone, we refer to a plurality. Anyone refers to a singularity. So any corpse is misunderstood by the robots and they kill the consumer. They kill the consumer the one who would have bought the corpse. So this is the important irony that in this, you know, cannibalistic society, in this market of, you know, uh, you know, selling and buying corpses, which is administered by non-human figures, the scavengers, what they end up doing is ironically killing the market by directly, you know, murdering the consumer himself or herself. We have a second part of the story where this same thing happens to a man who has bought the woman's body. In fact, she do he doesn't buy, and that's the important point, sorry about that. He doesn't buy her body, he gets her body because the body is left there. Once uh, the consumer is turned into a corpse, there is no one to consume that, that body. So the scavengers leave her without understanding that they have actually cancel the transaction, to put it like that. Now, this man sees this female body, brings it back, uh, puts life into it in a sort of sci-fi mechanism, in a, in a sort of uh, complicated machinic way, to understand what is going on in this world. Why is this world so strange? Why are people raining meat? Who are these scavengers? Where are all the people? Why are the people isolated and, and kind of in these little caves? So this mystery is not revealed because when the corpse comes back to life, the corpse of the woman, the corpse speaks like the man. So because he transfers an iota of his life through the machine into the corpse, the corpse thinks that it is him, not her. So the corpse doesn't have the memory of the dead woman. It has the memory of the man. And thus, there is no disclosure of this mystery. The story ends in a very sinister way when this man has the woman, eats her, roasts her and eats her for a week and goes back to the scavengers looking for a corpse and again makes the same mistake by saying 
any corpse. The, the scavengers have that programmed language, right? They say any corpse, they ask that question. And again, this man says, yes, any corpse. And they take him out to kill him. The story doesn't show that second murder. It ends right there. Now, two points to be made about this story. First is this connection between body and death seems to be happening here through language and equivocations of language. Human beings can understand certain equivocations of language, uh, certain kinds of ambivalences in language, but robots or non-human uh, figures perhaps cannot. And that's the sort of you know, underlying political commentary where the question of language comes in between body and death, as it were. Let me stop here, as far as this story is concerned, because I want to talk about a few other things. So when we talk about the representation of corporeality and death and dying, the process of dying in literature, as I say, these representations are partially uh, not dictated, but somewhat governed by the logic of the genre. For example, this is an uncanny story. This is a somewhat grotesque, disturbing, uncanny story. The story that Beckett writes is written in a very lyrical way. It's not an uncanny story. It's more like an emotive, affective story. The story that we discussed with Lawrence, again, is perhaps the most social realistic story of the three that I mentioned. But to, again, talk a little bit about the figure of the corpse that uh, the book I mentioned doesn't quite go into because it restricts itself to Anglo-American traditions. There's another famous figure of the corpse in the, the, the so-called absurdist theater in, in a famous play by Eugene Arnesco, there's this figure of the corpse and the play I have in mind, some of you perhaps already know about, this is Amidi. Amidi is the name of the play. We have a, a husband and a wife talking about their deeply problematic marriage and the failure of that relationship as it were. And all of a sudden we realize there is a corpse in the other room and this corpse is growing. And we, we, we come to know that the husband has killed this man because this man was the extramarital lover of his wife. Now, this is a very typical, you know, uh, triadic situation, uh, a failed marriage, extramarital affair, killing and so on. But what Ionesco makes of this is interesting. Ionesco makes this into this sort of absurd comedy, like a farce, you know, to, to use that expression uh, he would use about some of his plays, a tragic farce. He called Rhinoceros, his famous play, a tragic farce. So this particular figure of the corpse is quite interesting because we have the corpse as a metaphor. So now I'm talking about the meta metaphoricity of the corpse. This is not a corpse which is corporealized. This corpse is a metaphor of their corpse relationship. And what, what happens in the play, for those who've read it, is increasingly ludicrous. So this corpse is growing. It comes out of the room. We can see the leg. And it's, it's very interesting to stage this play. And this play had very interesting stagings. We can talk about that later. But in any case, uh, so we have this corpse, which is growing. And that's the important point. The whole apartment seems to be full of mushrooms. And just like a mushroom growing everywhere, this corpse is growing. So this figure of the growing corpse, in a way, inverts the fundamental belief of our culture, let's say human culture, that a corpse is the end of growth in the body. Of course, the body does not grow beyond a certain point in our aging process, but the corpse is the end of all bodily kinesis. There is no bodily movement once the body turns into a corpse. So what we have here is Inesco's reversal of this fundamental cultural belief that a corpse cannot grow. And I mean, the rest is this farcical set of situations where this man tries to get rid of the corpse. You know, the, the, the play has this subtitle, how to get rid of it. Amidi or how to get rid of it. So how to get rid of the corpse constitutes the rest of the play. And we have this bizarre situation where the corpse is carried out and then the corpse uh, 
uh, uh, see both the husband and the wife. They want to hide the corpse. The corpse floats. That's the ludicrous climax of this play, where the corpse floats and the husband uh, gets entangled in the corpse and he floats away too, along with the corpse. I mean, without going into the comic farcicality of the corpse, which could return us to a film like Jane Nido Yaro, the, the point here is this figure of the growing corpse. And again, to continue with this trope of the corpse, it's not that you know we only have this modernism. One of the greatest uh, sort of Greek tragedies, Antigone, was all about the corpse. The entire play is about Antigone's fight with Creon when it comes to the burial rites of his brother, of her brother, Polynesus. So Antigone does, you know, by any uh, sort of, by, by hook or crook, Antigone is absolutely desperate to give some sort of a burial to Polynesus. But Creon does not want that. And that's what constitutes the, the principal sort of tragic dynamic in the play. Uh, Dennis, uh, Dennis Schmidt and others have written on the, the figure of the corpse in Antigone. For, for those who are interested, I mean, you could again look that up. Uh, let me now come towards the end of this talk and suggest some other ways in which the corpse, or more generally, the body in relation to death is marked in literature. Now, we could talk about the question of necropolitics here. And again, I'll briefly allude to two references. I mean, again, uh, especially for students, you could uh, go into these questions and, and address them by talking about some books I'm, I'm, I'm mentioning here. So uh, there's, a, there's a book uh, by Rosie Braidotti. She's a famous post-humanist philosopher, uh, a philosopher who comes in that, that lineage of Deluge, whom I just mentioned. Uh, she has a book called The Post-Human. Now, in Rosie Braidotti's book, she goes at length to talk about necropolitics, and this thread is picked up in a very different way by the, the, the African, African French uh, philosopher, uh, Achille Mbembe. So Mbembe uh, picks this thread up partially from George Bataille, the French philosopher I mentioned alongside Blanchot. Uh, and, and they all talk about the biopolitics of death. You know, at some level, let me uh, at least make the general point. We could come back to this in the discussion. But uh, the question of biopolitics is how the, the state as an apparatus tries to manage our life. This is a famous Foucaultian idea, an idea of Michel Foucault's, which is uh, then sort of elaborated uh, very significantly and also critiqued in a way by the Italian philosopher Giorgio Agamben. Now, post Agamben, when we have this move towards necropolitics in uh, Raidoti, in a particular way, and in a different way in uh, Ashil Mbembe, what we are talking about is management of dead bodies or management of the dead. So biopolitics is not just the state's way of managing human life. It's also a governmentality of the dead in the sense that the dead bodies are managed by the, the government as it were. Now, to very quickly run this through a literary text, which responds to this biopolitical question of necropolitics. Let me mention this uh, fantastic little story by the Bengali writer Navarun Bhattacharya. And the story is called Cold Fire. Now, in the story, we have uh, a seller who comes to this sort of posh bourgeois Bengali Bhadralok and wants to sell a particular machine. This is a personal funeral device, a device where one does not have to go to the Shamshan Ghat in order to do the funerals. The Shamshan Ghats are you know, dingy places and so on. This is how the seller sells this product, that you don't have to go to the Shamshan Ghats. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a dingy place. Let's do this at home. It can be done beautifully, elegantly, without any problem whatsoever. This particular machine is called cold fire. You just put the body in and the funeral is done, you get the ashes and the remains. So this indoor funeral service, cold fire, is uh, commoditized and, and, and sold off 
by this particular salesman who has a very sort of typical you know capitalist sales pitch uh, the the bengali babu likes it and likes the fact that he doesn't have to go to the dingy you know uh, shamshan ghats and he buys it and the story ends uh, it's a very brief story the story ends with the death of this bengali babu soon after he had bought old fire now as of course uh, you already understand the story through this commodity called cold uh, cold fire this 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 story talks about necropolitics talks about the ways in which uh, you know everything is commoditized including death again we are in the middle of a pandemic right we can clearly see how death has become an object of control for the status governmental principles you know again there are uh, there are no rights on the covid body for example when when someone dies uh, the family members don't get to do the last rites which means they don't have that kind of emotional closure they would have had in a normal situation so we can see by using this as a medical emergency there's a certain way in which uh, we are talking about the governmental control of not just the body that is alive but also a control of the body that is dead so in this story by navarun we have this you know very interesting point about commoditization of death with all its sort of class caste ramifications now this brings me to the last point i want to make very briefly about body from the politics of caste and again we could connect this with the question of the post human body what is a post human body a post human body is this understanding of the human body which is not in control of itself and the body is not entirely human either it's like a microbial idea of the body where the body in its biological constitutiveness is full of non human elements i mean if you think of it our bodies have more bacteria than anything you know so there's 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 no such thing as a human body this idea of a human body from a biomedical point of view is an illusion there is no human body what we have is a, a set of non human elements constituting something like a culturally humanized body now when we think of the question of corporeality and death uh, the question of caste becomes very important because of the caste system there's a certain kind of experience a close proximity with death that particular dalit subjects would have and again when we are talking about the dalit subject we are talking about a particular way in which the body is inflected and inflicted by caste the the monstrosity of the caste system and the way it divides labor as well as laborers in our country so what we have in the dalit body for example think about the body of the manual scavenger the body that always interacts with waste or the the body of the dome in a shamshan ghat who's helping with the funeral process so there's a there are many ways you know the 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 dalit body that is engaged in the act of you know taking away a dead animal from the side of the the road so the dalit body has being theorized by someone like dipesh chakraborty for example and i'm thinking of uh, a, a chapter he wrote in this book called the empire of disgust again if you're interested if you could read this chapter i think if memory serves right it's the first chapter of this book the empire of disgust and chakraborty at length talks about the post human experiences marked in this caste inflicted body of the dalit subject who has to engage with all these experiences that you know create a certain proximity with death and this is not an experience that the brahminical body would have or the body of the so called upper caste subjects would necessarily have at least on an everyday basis so the question of body or corporeality and death these questions can be seen through uh, these multiple lenses the political lens as well i briefly mentioned mental humanities i know we are running out of time so i'll briefly at least mention the book that some of you if you're interested could go ahead and read this is a book that came out uh, in 2015 uh, the cambridge companion to the body 
And it's a very interesting book which has multiple essays by leading scholars of corporeality on different aspects of the body. Uh, some of the scholars talk about aging and body. Others talk about sexuality and body. There's a chapter on uh, the psychoanalytic ramifications of the body, which I didn't get the time to go into. Uh, uh, maybe I'll finish with one sentence on that. But uh, the, the Cambridge Companion to the Body in Literature is a, a book to read if you're interested in all the different ways in which the body is studied in literature. Of course, there are literary texts uh, following Foucault where we could bring in this question of the medical gaze, how the medical gaze scans the body, how the body is this legible object for medical gaze. So again, that's a lens which a lot of medical humanities scholars uh, approach corporeality through. But I was specifically interested in that question of corporeality and death. So I'll finish now in the next three minutes with two final observations. And as I said, this is not a presentation where I've posited one central argument. It's more like parallel reflections. Uh, two final uh, points, and I'm, I'm happy to come back to these things if they remain a little bit enigmatic in the question and answer session. Uh, the first is about this question of time. All our bodies are future corpses. So in that sense, corpse is not really an other. Corpse is the future possibility of each of our human bodies. That's one question where the question of the corpse and the gap between the body that is alive and the body that dies, these two bodies and the gap in between can be bridged through time because we are our future corpses in that sense. The second point, and this is a more theoretical point that psychoanalysis brings in, uh, I won't go into this, but uh, we could talk about this more if, if you're interested. Uh, so for psychoanalysis in the Lacanian orientation, which is my training and expertise, so I will restrict myself to that, there is this understanding that all corporeal drives are death drives. All corporeal drives are death drives. And this is not the Freudian understanding. Freud makes a very clear distinction between, you know, uh, uh, oral drive and anal drive. And not all drives are sex drives, uh, are death drives. All drives are sex drives, but not all drives are death drives for Freud. Uh, this is an, uh, uh, a particular advancement made in Lacanian psychoanalysis. Laca also adds gaze and voice to the other two Freudian drives. So we have four drives here. And as you know, drives are corporeal entities. It's like a pulsion in the human body. Now, all drives are death drives is a particular thesis in Lacan, which also brings us back to the question uh, of how do we understand our own deaths? You know, the question I started with, the Heideggerian question. Is the death of the other uh, relevant enough to communicate or powerful enough to communicate the nuance of our own death? Is it not a second-hand experience? What about that first-hand experience that we don't have? Now, uh, Lacanian psychoanalysis would see language in its material dimension, speech, as a manifestation of death and speech as a way in which we get an idea about our own death. So speech in psychoanalysis becomes this sort of parasitical object. Speech doesn't sit very well on our bodies. There is a discomfiture or there is a discord, let's say, between the body and speech. And I'm sort of alluding to Lacan's uh, late teachings here and the idea of the Parletra, Parletra as the speaking being. This is the speaking being of the body, the body that speaks. But there, there is no, I mean, this hyphenation, speaking body, if we put a hyphen there between speaking and body, there is no continuity here. In fact, there is a discontinuity. Body is marked by death through speech. And this is the psychoanalytic nuance which suggests we are always already dead. So we are not just temporally carrying our own corpses in our body as a future possibility. That's a question of time future, right? But in psychoanalytic terms, we are always already dead because all the drives are 
partial, fragmented, they're all death drives, and speech itself installs a, a, a sense of death in our bodies. I'll finish with that. Thank you so much for your listening. Okay. Thank you, Arkodab. Uh, thank you for taking us into those narrow and difficult alleys of philosophy and literature. Uh, I must say that uh, the session is very pertinent, uh, especially in this context of pandemic, when uh, we as a civilization have been reduced to the primordial way of life and dwindling between life and death. So uh, this course will definitely help us to interact and live better. So uh, there are lots of uh, comments, suggestions, and uh, questions as well. And I'll start with the first question. Um, it's from Rituparna Shengupto. She is asking, if there is a corporeal experience of death, is there a possibility of translation of this experience? So I would say there is no corporeal experience of one's own death, right? I mean, we could have a fantasy, of course, uh, death has always charged our fantasies uh, more than other things, partially because we have no experience of that phenomenon in our bodies. So the question of translation would come only when you know there's a there's a possibility of that experience. For example, we do have you know uh, literary texts that try and capture the the corporeal experience of death, uh, but do they succeed? Uh, it's a question. Again, we are not talking about the death of the other. That is, of course, an experience all of us have by default, almost, right? But we do not have the experience of our death. We do have an experience of our dying, as I speak, but not death. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Um, okay. The next question is from Mira Kasiraman. Uh, she is asking, in the Indian context, are there are any writers or works on body that come to your mind, sir, and some reading suggestion if you would like to uh, give them. Right. Okay. Thank you. I mean, um, yeah, it's a difficult question because I've been grappling with the same question. Um, so from the last uh, point that I mentioned, or one of the last points about caste and body, uh, I was recently reading short stories by Babu Rao Babu, and this is a, a, a collection of short stories uh, translated by Jerry Pinto, who himself is a great writer. Uh, this is a short story collection called When I Hid My Cast. It came out in 2018. When I Hid My Cast by Babu Rao Babu. It's very interesting how corporeal these stories are. I mean, at, at one point I was thinking if I had the time, I would have gone into this particular story about the street walker, which is about a, a, a prostitute, a female prostitute uh, uh, in in. You know, uh, and, and the entire story is about corporeality. I mean, it's too late for that. I won't go into details of stories. So that's one story that uh, I would you know, advise perhaps uh, you to read. Thank you. Or one, one collection of stories, rather. One book. Okay. Um, the next question is from uh, Shumon Chakraborty. He is asking, how do you relate the concept of death to the physicalist idea of uh, quote unquote philosophical zombie, body without consciousness? Yeah, again, this is a big question, right? Uh, a question I didn't want to go into because there's a lot of literature on this and uh, there's a lot of uh, discourse on this. Unfortunately, there is relatively less discourse when we talk about the question of uh, physicality and death without this notion of the zombie. So the reason why I didn't want to go into, but of course, I mean, when we say zombification, that does not mean the, the zombie as such. Zombification as a process, as a corporeal mutation, is somewhat similar to what I was talking about. I mean, the figure of the undead, or you know, the figure who is neither dead nor alive, somewhere in between. And uh, there are, again, ramifications of this when we think of it through the genre question, if you think of zombie films, for example, and you know how they are also turned on their head with 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 comic endeavors as well. Uh, I mean, I'm not really someone who works on the zombie, and I have my own personal sort of distance from the the figure of the zombie. Somehow, it's not the the object that really draws 
my attention personally speaking uh, when when we when we think of the horror genre which i like otherwise so i restrict myself to that there might be other questions okay um so uh, there are some few questions um one is from ranjana mehrotra uh, she is asking do you think that this avoiding of reference to corpse may be associated with the human tendency to shy away from the macabre yeah yeah definitely there is no doubt about that i mean uh, i still remember uh, danis schmidt who i mentioned uh, in the stock uh, in in western city university uh, he was giving a talk on heidegger and idiomaticity in heidegger the, the notion of the idiom in, in heidegger schmidt is a famous heidegger scholar scholar so schmidt in fact after uh, almost an hour uh, long talk said that you know, are we feeling a little bit depressed that now that we are talking about you know death and and corpses and and you know the experience of death for an hour so yes there is a certain macabre uh, notion uh, attached to the corpse which is why we tend to avoid it but in a very different and a more affective register if we think of someone in our family who has passed away the last time we see that person is in the form of a corpse so there is that deep affective value value attached to the corpse if we uh, buy this argument that the corpse is the person some some people may not believe that some people would like to think that that is not my family member that is someone else something else right so again it it depends on that disposition and very briefly uh, before on you should go over to the next question because i can see the chat box uh, someone has i think gunjan right has very helpfully mentioned emily dickinson's poem that's right i mean i heard a fly buzz is one of those famous poems where dickinson actually exercises uh, or or attempts to do this exercise of talking about her own death but the very fact that she has to do this in the form of a literary text uh, also attests attests to the impossibility of this experience that we cannot experience our own death but thank you gunjan for that okay now we'll uh, move to our next question uh, uttam banerjee he is asking in case of literature related to tantra and dark fantasy we often see that life is inserted into dead bodies and dead bodies are often related with sadhanas of a higher level will you please explain that sir so oh, that's again a completely different territory right i must say i don't work on tantra and literature but uh, you're absolutely right that there is a whole uh, tantric conceptualization of the body uh, it will be interesting to see however how they think of the question of death because uh from whatever i know about the tantric system there's a certain idea of the cosmic body right body is considered as a cosmic matter and there are chakras in the body for example i mean if you think of the whole idea of kundalini kundalini and chakra these are ways of approaching that sort of point of connection between the human body and some sort of a non-human cosmic body so through a spiritual avenue one could think of the tantric system of corporeality as a sort of a post human system if not post human at least there's an acknowledgement of the non human aspects of the body where the body is is meeting all these other non corporeal uh, or let's say non human corporealities uh, right so so at that level and again if we think of uh, in in the context of bengali literature one could think of uh, tarana tantric and and you know the figure of tarana tantric how you know not just uh, the stories that tarashankar himself wrote but also his son uh, continued writing these stories as you would know and and there's there's something very interesting that happens in you know tarana tantric stories where there's a very elaborate and very intricate uh, engagement with the system of tantra on the part of tarashankar and and, and later on uh taradash on so it's, it's very interesting to think of texts like that where tantra uh, is theoretically engaged with in the sort of you know genre of the horror story yeah i would i would stop there but thank you for the question 
Okay, um, Alpuda, actually, we are uh, running short of time. That's why uh, we, we cannot take all those questions. Now, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll just ch check the YouTube comment section. So I'll request to our Professor Gaurav Dotto to check if there is any question. Hello. Hello. Yes, Gaurav Dotto. We can hear you. Am I not good? Yeah. Okay. There are a couple of questions in the YouTube section. Yeah, please. Uh, yeah. Uh, anyway, uh, first let me uh, let me tell you. Yeah. Uh, it is from Mr. Amrit Mishra, uh, who is a JRF uh, from EFL, and his question is. Uh, how are the prospects for existential psychology in terms of research, outreach, and funding? Okay. I like the professional nature of that question. Thank you. So, uh, I don't think I was talking anything which went into existential psychology, because first of all, whether Heidegger was an existentialist or not is up for discussion. I mean, it's not uh, a, decis a decisive sort of categorization at all. Uh, in fact, more recently, Heidegger has been taken out of that tradition more than taken back in. But uh, but yeah, I mean, in the sense that there was this sort of Sartrean development of existentialist psychoanalysis and existentialist psychology uh, following Heidegger. Uh, I mean, I do see the point in your question, but honestly speaking, I'm not the right person to answer that question because I work on psychoanalysis, which is very different from uh, existential psychology, and my interests in Heidegger are strictly philosophical and not psychological. Yeah. So, I'm not the best person. I think Google would know better. Okay, so there's another question by uh, Pearline Priscilla. Uh, she's asking, or he's, I, I cannot, uh, okay. Uh, Julia Kristeva speaks about the disgust and the abject of the human body and the conception of corpse. Do you see the corpse as the disgust and one to be objected? Uh, what, can you please just repeat the last sentence once? Do you see the corpse as the disgust and the one to be objected? Okay, this is a very interesting question. And yes, I mean, uh, Kristeva's work on the abject could well be part of a discussion, a larger discussion of the corpse. And uh, because in a way, corpse is like an abject body. And Pristeva sort of plays with that idea of abject and object, abjection as a sort of principle of the body. So Pristeva is definitely very relevant to this uh, conceptualization of the corpse. Uh, again, I'm not sure exactly how the question would work there. Is it so, sorry, sorry to kind of go uh, take you over this once again. Uh, go rock. If you could just tell me the last sentence once more, which is the question? Yeah, the question was. Uh, I, I'll re I, I'll uh, read the whole thing that she has written. Julia Kristeva speaks about the disgust and the abject of the human body and the conception of corpse. So, do you see the corpse as the disgust and one to be abjected? Yeah. Okay. Right. So this kind of brings us back to that idea of the macabre corpse. Corpse as something disgusting. I mean, that's one way of looking at it, of course. But in fact, if if you follow the sort of the the direction of my presentation, I was trying to make a slightly different argument at certain points, at least in this general presentation, where the corpse could become a very important, let's say, object of memory an object of nostalgia, a memory, a last memory of the person who's like a dear departed. So this, this question of corpse and disgust, to necessarily couple corpse with disgust might be interrogated further. And I think that's where one could possibly uh, engage with Kristeva, but step away from that idea of, you know, corpse as a disgusting object. Because there might be more in the corpse, you know. That's that's what I was trying to sort of get at. The politics of the corpse, for example, when we think of the you know the Dalit mobilization of the body and its relation to death. I mean, there's a there's a certain politics to that, which would in fact be reduced 
if we sort of very you know simply uh, identify corpse with disgust so maybe there are i'm not saying that's not a way that is definitely a dominant cultural way of looking at the corpse but there could be other ways of looking at the corpse more emotive ways yeah thank you okay well uh, thank you orkoda thank you for this very insightful and enriching session uh, thank you again thank you so much and i'll so, I'll, i'll stick around i'll just switch off my audio and video maybe and i'll i'll, I'll stick around for show it's too thank you so much for the okay. invitation again on it yeah and and thanks okay, for listening okay, thank bye bye okay okay so uh, now we'll move to our next session uh, our next speaker is dr shourid bhattacharya you will be talking on hunger and post colonial bengali literature uh, he is already with us and we again heartily welcome him uh, dr shourid bhattacharya is a lecturer in post colonial studies at the university of glasgow he has finished his phd from warwick university uk his research interest include post colonial literature famine and food security studies translation studies marxism and literary form his works in this areas are either published or forthcoming in such journals as aerial textual practice interventions irish university review and in edited books such as cambridge critical concepts magic realism the aesthetics and the politics of global hunger and others his first monograph titled post colonial modernity and the indian novel on catastrophic realism was published by paul grip in june 2020 his co-edited volume on navarun bhattacharya is scheduled to be out from bloomsbury in september 2020 shoudit is a founding co-editor of prashangalap journal of literary and cultural inquiry over to you shoudit okay uh, can you hear me on image yeah i can hear you. okay all right yeah um first of all uh, thank you so much i'd like to thank dr chakraborty and kk das college for inviting me over and having me today and to onimesh for all the hard work thank you so much for organizing this uh, my apologies that i couldn't be here from the beginning i probably missed the first part of our course talk and was there since the discussion on coves began and something to do with my uh, topic today as well so uh, very very well done or co a sort of setting up the stage for me uh, as you have been doing quite often and i was also thinking about his discussion about amd and this went back to some of our discussions um in presidency college would be uh, in our second year would be reading a lot about this kind of um european uh, modernist literature or theater and we were both very excited with amd the, the, the and i faintly uh, my vague remembrances we tried to probably also enact it on stage of course for for a local sort of admiring audience but it didn't work out but because who would be the corps which is the which is going to be growing right uh, so it's a challenging uh, situation but uh, that is that nicely brings me or ties me to my discussion today about hunger and uh, post colonial bengali literature the kind of reference the sort of example that i will uh, give you today is also going to be about corpse and uh, not only necessarily about corpse but a growing body a body that sort of uh, grows gigantically sort of demolishes buildings etc uh, because of the sudden overdose of food now let me um, begin with uh, so initially i planned to share some powerpoints etc but um, just find out with the google meet the last time it didn't work out uh i'll just try and see if it does or else i'll just go about sort of uh my usual presentation as in like you know uh, giving the lecture mostly in the verbal mode so i'll just try once just give me a couple of minutes please uh right uh can you confirm if if you can see these things um because when i present i can't see you so if anyone uh, so if onimesh can just like uh confirm that uh, you can see uh, this yes 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 sure okay. that it is visible now 
Okay, okay. Because these are not a lot of slides. These are like just few slides to uh, to show, uh, like to read out the the quotes, so that we are there on the same page. And I'll be stopping the slides to come back to the presentation again. Um, so let me start. So this is the topic: hunger and post-colonial Bengali literature. And um, you do not often see uh, Bengali literature with the adjective post-colonial. And that's something that uh, sort of has also bothered me to some extent that um, what is it that Bengali literature or in that sense, uh, Hindi literature, Urdu literature or Marathi literature, the broader Indian literatures. Um, when we talk about post-colonial literature, it's mostly Indian literature, Indian writings in English. Are the regional, local, vernacular languages post-colonial uh, or their literatures post-colonial? And if colonialism has shaped the way we think, the way we do our everyday uh, workings, the way we you know, sort of exercise our law, uh, the way we discipline our body, uh, it, then the post-colonial times and uh, it's uh, sort of the, the imagination and the culture will have to capture that as well, right? You can't escape from that. So that's something that I have been uh, thinking about that uh, in a sense, is Bengali literature post-colonial, or can there be something like that? And there is one particular piece that came out a uh, couple of years ago by um, Oritro Mojumdar, who asked this question, can Bengali literature be post-colonial? So I'll not go much into this particular discussion, whether Assamese or Bengali or Marathi literature are post-colonial. I'll just keep with the topic that is, uh, what is it that hunger uh, relates to or translates into the post-colonial domain of Bengali or the post-colonial meaning of Bengali literature. So let me start with the key terms, hunger. So this is what uh, Oxford English Dictionary uh, sort of defines it. A feeling of discomfort or weakness caused by lack of food coupled with desire to eat. Now, as you can understand with this particular definition, a feeling of discomfort or weakness, right? It's very physical. And, uh, you know, th there is probably not anybody uh, present today who hasn't in some way or the other superficially maybe or for for a for for, for a, for a um, temporary uh, moment haven't felt hunger right or felt what it means like when the body goes through that right so i'm not talking about the seriousness of it all in terms of malnutrition and hunger in the entire nation but i'm talking about like the bodily part of it that we have felt with our body what it means like so that's the discomfort or the weakness part but if you can also see the other uh, part of it, the definition, the desire to eat is also psychological. You can't, so hunger uh, is also craving, right? So what I'm trying to get to is that, that we cannot talk about hunger without at least engaging with the sort of physical and the psychological domains. So this is uh, the quote that I wanted to uh, uh, sort of read out with you. And uh, this, is, this comes from uh, James Varnon, uh, his book, Hunger, A Modern History. 2007. Now, what happened? Um, so James uh, Vernon uh, sort of begins his book with um, with a topical example that um, you know in the 9/11. He is based in I think uh, California, Berkeley. Uh, so the topical example comes from the fact that the 9/11 had killed. 3,000, 2,500 people, and it became a spectacle. Of course, it, it, it was a spectacle, um, a spectacle of demolition, so to say. Um, but then he says that more than 3,500 people die every day of uh, hunger. Um, and that's that's the comparison that he wants to, like that, that's a bit of a sensational beginning, of course, because he wants to draw people's attention to a more of a popular, uh, a book to, that bridges popular and academic research. Uh, sort of, so the point is, if it is so bad, um, even uh, when he was talking about in uh, America, in the US, we're not talking about only people who are so called by different indices is called poor, right? The, he's talking about the US, and this says like about 20, like, uh, 10 percent of its population, and the book was published in 2007, 10 percent of its population did not uh, know how to secure their meal the next time. Uh, that's the situation. We never talk about hunger, poverty, etc. in some of these European or American, sort of North American countries. Now, uh, the point being that this, if this is so, uh, such an everyday, such a wide, serious issue, why isn't uh, the, the sort of the cultural or the 
historical domain or the sort of academic domains are not talking so much about it. It's not true entirely. And he goes on to uh, answer that this is not entirely true. A lot of work is being done, but it is just that hunger remains a social scientific domain or a domain of, let's say, uh, the hard sciences. Uh, his book, as you can understand, A Modern History, is more about reading hunger in a cultural and historical framework. So this is what he says, and I'm going to be reading it out for you. We need to take seriously the very slipperiness of hunger as a category for the modern proliferation of terms signifying its various states, ranging from starvation to malnutrition and dieting, how they bear witness to its challenging forms and meanings. And uh, sort of the quote continues, seeing hunger as a cultural category as much as a material condition, for it was always necessarily both, allows us to challenge the assumption that it is simply an illustrative consequences of other stories, other histories, namely the rise of capitalism and imperialism, or the growth of democratic systems and welfare states. Too often hunger tends to be read as the result of a pre-existing set of socioeconomic interests and groups competing for entitlements in a zero-sum game with power invariably centralized in the nation state. So I just wanted to uh, get there uh, before I go to the other, other part. So the point here being is that, um, you know, he's just, uh, he, he tries to shift our attention from um, from a particular a phenom from a particular reading of a phenomenon to another reading which is more everyday which is more cultural which is the way we feel when we feel about so if if, if you think about somebody uh, when, when we see this tragic news somebody dying of hunger you know uh, you know somebody what, what they had probably gone through because hunger is some as, as I said in the beginning maybe like all of us have experienced it at some point not even if superficially. So this is where my top is uh, located today. Can we read hunger in a cultural framework? Can we read hunger in a literary framework? Because in, whenever there is a discussion about hunger, we always see that the hunger is always at the background. Can we bring it to the foreground? And if we can do so, and if we want to do so, if literary writers want to do so, what kind of changes in form and style or what kind of changes in aesthetics, the way the a novel or a short story is, is generally patterned, what kind of a change or what kind of a sort of an improvement, let's say, um, improvising, uh, improvisation, they would have to think about, right? And how do we as literary critics read those improvisations, right? So this is where I, I start. So uh, let me, uh, this, is, this is the definition and this is the topic that I have in mind. So let me go to, um, I'll just stop sharing the screen for now and come back and then share again. Uh, so let me start with the, uh, the topicality of it, right? Hunger and let's say India. Uh, I mean, why I said post-colonial Bengali literature will be clear uh, with this. So this is, um, this, is, this is a report that I want to read out uh, quickly. Right, so this is uh, a, a, a situation of, as I said, um, Hunger, if it is material and if it is cultural, it's also a situation of food security. Like if the country is able to feed its population. Now, why I say so? Because the recent uh, Global Hunger Index, which is a tool that International Food Policy Research Institute, based in the US, they use to understand what stage of uh, sort of you know a food crisis or hunger a particular country is at. And India, for instance, has ranked according to this particular index, uh, in a very serious situation. Uh, they are, I believe we are at 102 out of 117 countries, right? So, and that has uh, progressively declined over the years. Now, this is something that we get to know because of news and social media everywhere, but um, we also think about what, what could we do? Are the policies working all right so that people uh, you know, are getting enough food? Now. The point being here is that that hunger is not always because of uh, food supply or food shortage issue. And if you would know a little bit of, of these issues, you'd know that India has been producing food consistently in the last few decades. It's not that there is a shortage of food. It's just that sometimes there are multiple factors responsible for uh, a country's 
let's say, a uh, sort of a stunted growth um, and uh, sort of growth becomes and bodily growth becomes an important situation. And malnutrition, the, when these sort of indices work, they, they see also how a child is growing. Uh, right? How what is what is uh, its a particular so the measurements of the body, uh, the nutrition, the food, etc. That the intakes of it, all of these things are taken into consideration. So um, I wanted to read out this particular part that um, well, organizations such as um, as I just said, international food and research organizations such as these consider sustainable food production, healthy or nutritious diet, or strong trade and governmental support as key to food security and hunger uh, conditions. Hunger is not always a result of food production and availability or administrative efficiency. In a vast country like India, which has a complex administrative and distributive system of social welfare and governance, in which religion and caste play a significant role in mobilizing food discourses, hunger and starvation are not solely a consequence of environmental or economic forces. There are political and social forces too. So for instance, in 2017, an 11-year-old girl, Santoshi Kumari, died of starvation in Jharkhand, Indian state of Jharkhand, after not getting rations under the state-run PDS scheme for several months because the ration card wasn't linked to the Aadhaar card. And we probably, may, some of us, have seen it uh, in the newspapers um, uh, in 2017. And uh, then data from 2018 showed that out of 42 deaths from starvation, 25 died uh, for the lack of other card links. So think about how even governmentality, governmental organizations, governmental tools might also contribute to manufacturing hunger, starvation and deaths based on that. In another study from 2018, Archana Kaushik finds that Dalits and lower caste groups are more vulnerable to hunger and starvation because social welfare workers practice untouchability and other discrimination preventing the poor from state benefits. This was published in Contemporary Voices of Dalit, a journal run by Sage. Now, point here being, as I just wanted to make sure that hunger is not entirely or malnutrition or entirely a question about whether uh, there was enough rainfall, whether there was enough uh, food production or there was enough supply. Sometimes even social, biological, governmental factors play a significant role. And if these things play a significant role, then... Um, I mean, how do you deal with it, right? So, um, especially in art and culture, how do you represent some of these gigantic sort of tentacular sort of networks, right? And this is something that I want to bring back again to the historical part of it, that this food crisis is not something very new. I mean, we started the, our sort of our, let's say, uh, our birth was marked by a huge food crisis in not only in Bengal, but in the eastern region of India that uh, sort of culminated in the famine, 1943 famine. And then it, it, it had that sort of repercussions, the political repercussions. You would remember some of you based in Bengal would probably know about the uh, Tevaga movement. And then some of you maybe in the south may know about or maybe like everyone knows about the Telangana peasant movements. It's all about securing crops from uh, the, the such a two thirds and one third share of crops. So many of these things, many of the important social movements in India were based on securing food. Like you know, I'm, uh, how much like, we are producing food but not getting enough in return. So that's how we began. If we read it for slightly from a different perspective, that's how India as an independent country began with an immense uh, sort of huge food crisis. And some of you in Bengal probably would remember or know about the food movements that happened in the 50s and 60s. Now, if it is happening so broadly, socially and politically, it's impossible for literature and art not to capture that. Right. So that's where my interest lies. Like, how does then literature and art capture that? So let me remind you, if some of you have watched... Um, Satyajit Ray's uh, sort of iconic film, Pothir Pachali, you remember like, um, I think Indira Thakrun, some of the, much of the film was about, actually about food. And um, you would see that some of the characters, how they look at food. Uh, and this is a time when India, I mean, that, that, that's the thing that I'm trying to do. What is it that the directors, the authors, or the you know the artists, or the writers, what are they doing uh, to sort of remind us that we are going through this crisis in the 1950s, let's say? So these are uh, these are mostly in the background, but uh, of course, like 
it's up, up to us, literary critics, how we read them, right? So if we want to think about organizing a literature based on food, organizing literary works and artistic works based on their representation of food and food crisis, to understand how over a period of five or six decades, people have responded to the question of food crisis, everyday question of food crisis, then we have to see it from a different perspective, right? How these tiny moments, they, they also reflect these tensions, these tensions going on on an everyday basis. Now, I'd like to remind you that it's not only a question about uh, India, as in like, you know, if we think about some of the films that we uh, in the 40s would come out, so Mahbub Khan's Roti or Mother India or Bimal Kaur's uh, Do Viga Zameen, these are all coming out in the 1950s. Roti was 1942. As you can understand, these are all about securing food and uh, sort of a, a struggle about securing food, a struggle with the upper caste or the upper class, a struggle between classes and castes about um, a sort of everyday share of uh, their commodities, everyday commodities. And then uh, some of the writers, the English, Indian English writers, let's say Babani Bhattacharya, would write two novels, at least, on the Bengal famine. Uh, so, so many hungers and then after that, uh, one uh, he who writes a tiger. And then he would also write a novel called Music for Mohini ext with extended discussions on food and poverty. This is again 1952. And then there is like um, R.K. Narayan's The Guide. I mean, one of the iconic stories uh, or narratives you grew up with The Guide, if you remember. Uh, and I'd, I'd like to remind you because that probably would capture some of the, uh, or probably be helpful for you to think about the way that I would like to think when it comes to organize food as an organ organizing artistic principle. If you remember the railway guide Raju, uh, who had experienced everything from penury to and starvation to wealth, fraudulence and imprisonment, is turned into a saint by the rural population due to his bearded face and renunciatory mode of living in a remote village in the um, place in the village of Mangal. The villagers want him to go through the saintly ordeals and bring rain to this drought ravaged land. Narayan describes how crime, death and violence rise in the village due to lack of food. The novel ends as Raju, standing in a river, dry river, and praying to God, collapses, whispering that the rains are coming, that he can feel cold water running beneath his feet, uh, etc. So food, starvation, and scarcity appear to be organizing principles for the narrative. Why Raju become a saint, how it went on, what is expected of him. Like as if like uh, these things force sainthood upon Raju and compel Narayan to use the various narrative strategies of prolepsis and analepsis, free indirect discourse, irony, mythical interpolation to build Raju's past and then relate it to the present where he's given the chance to absolve his guilt through the sainthood discourse. So this is something, I, another one I'm thinking about is Mulkraj Anand's The Road or even before uh, Untouchable. You know about um, Bagha. So these are these are in the 1950s and 60s. Some of the Indian English examples, so to say, where we're talking about where food comes again and again, food and poverty they come again and again. Uh, it's not only necessarily. Uh, I mean, poverty and hunger are part of the discourses and people would say that these are going to be, uh, you know, uh, taken for granted that you know a nation is growing up and these are the challenges. But in my interest lies in how exactly are they? showing that? Are they sentimentalizing? Are they being, making it sensational? Or are they trying to make a case out of it? Even sentimentality, does it have sort of a, uh, a message beyond the commercialization of it all? So to come back to the Bengal part of it, and I'd be, uh, again, I'd be sort of short here, brief here, uh, is that um, because of the 1943 Bengal famine, Post-colonial, if we th think about post-colonial, let's say post-colonial is not something which is historically after 1947. Because as I said in the beginning, if post-colonial, if colonialism is something that has shaped us, that has shaped our thinking, our imagination in the way that we exercise our daily life, in the way that we are educated and are sort of brought to think, then it is not about 1947 that colonialism ended and then we uh, went to a completely different age. Of course, right, um, you know, how, how, how even 70 years of independence, 73, 74 years, 73 years of independence, we're still thinking about um, some of the challenges of food crisis that began maybe like in the early 21st century, early 20th century. So point here being that uh, if these, these things are happening, then like the 1943 Bengal famine, then you know that 1947 or literature written in 1948 would not be entirely out of the world, right? Uh, about uh, All about utopia, all about a new nation. Of course, there is literature talking about the new nation being built, but the nation has just brought, inherited uh, some of the crisis from the 
concept of a nation that it had during the British Raj, right? So here I would like to remind you of some of the uh, writers or uh, works that in the 1960s and 70s or 50s and 60s onward. So if you think about uh, a Bengali writer, Gopal Haldar, who wrote um, a trilogy about the 1943 Bengal famine called Poncha Sher Pathe, towards 50s, towards the 50s, that means towards 1943. Uh, and these are very interesting novels. These are like, you know, 400, 500 page novels just based on one day. It's like definitely you understand that it could be the, the influence, the sort of inspiration lies back, uh, maybe broadly speaking, maybe Ulysses, maybe James Joyce's Ulysses, even uh, before that, there might be sort of more Indian uh, examples of it as well. But for, for us students uh, in interest uh, in English literature, you know, one of the epic works would be uh, Joyce's Ulysses, right? And then uh, we know about, uh, let's say, Back then it was East Pakistan, but then we know about uh, Bangladeshi writers writing in Bangla. So Abu Ishaq wrote this novel called Surjo Dighal Bari. Uh, so, so what is happening here is that already, and I'm not talking about the, the literature coming out of the famine. For instance, uh, you know about Bibuti Bhushan Bandhupadhyay writing uh, Oshoni uh, Shonket, the ominous sign, and then Manik Bandhupadhyay writing Chintamoni. Tarashanko writing uh, Munnantar, and then these are all happening in the 1940s. And then 1950s onward, Tarashanko is writing Arubuniketan. So again, coming the 1953-54, again, sort of some of the discussions about science, medicine, poverty, hunger, they come back. Hunger, especially food, comes back again and again in Tarashanko's writings. And we are now also talking about, uh, you know, extended uh, I mean, ideas, discussions. We are also thinking about here. Uh, let's say in the 60s, a new um, like you know breed of writers, let's say, are coming out. Say, for instance, Sunil Gangopadhyay, right? Um, in his uh, debut novel, Atto Prakash, and later on, I think it's called Onnu Jivanesh Shad. Some of these novels, Sunil Gangopadhyay is going and talking about the 1950s and 60s Calcutta, and um, and uh, then Shankar, Jono Orunno, and then um, of course later on. Uh, Shomuresh Boshu in, in different, uh, and then uh, definitely uh, after that, the kind of writings that we call regional writings. So um, a number of writers like, and here I'd not go into the examples, uh, you probably find out more, the regional writings as in like, you know, Devish, uh, Devish Rai and then um, a sort of, uh, I just forgot the name. Um, so Ovijit Shain, Devesh Rai, and a, and, a, and, a, and a list of writers who are writing more about the regional territory. It's a very complicated, interesting term, regional, not going to that. But the point here being that there is a, if we just want to see if the way that they have used food, the way they have they used the crisis, you could see that, that they have been engaging with uh, the issue. They, Anyone could hardly sort of not engage with that, but engaging in different fashions. So, for instance, Gunomoy Manna, writing about the Noxalite, uh, Noxalbury movement, um, he is dealing with it in, in a local village um, in, in the uh, sort of uh, northern parts of the regions of Bengal in a much more different um, fashion, uh, let's say from, uh, or let's say than um, somebody writing about Calcutta, right? And uh, how many of you, I, I'm not really sure, but I'm sure many of you probably know about the Calcutta trilogy of Mrinal Shen. And in all these uh, films, or, or, or no, the ones written, the ones directed by Ritti Ghorok, or uh, Shotojit's Calcutta trilogy, Shotojit also has a Calcutta trilogy. So these are films which come back again and again about the Tremendous amount of tension and struggle uh, of characters not being able to deal with an everyday crisis of sort of securing their everyday crisis of food and securing their meals. Uh, I'm not even going into unemployment, jobs, etc. But broadly speaking, as I said throughout, if we want to bring the principle of like uh, artistic principle here of food and food crisis, we find out that most of these writings are dealing with food crisis, as I said in the beginning, in the background. That's a crisis that is sort of forcing these people to go out in the open and do something, right? It's pretty much like the, uh, you know, very vulgar reading of base and superstructure in the Marxist uh, sort of framework, that the base is something like, uh, such as the food crisis and the superstructure is everything that you are doing. So the directors, the artists are not talking about the base food crisis, they're dealing with the cultural and the everyday psychological tensions. So um, I'm, I do not want to encourage you to do this kind of a framework, but just a for, a, for an example. Now, 
if there is one writer who has consistently talked about this uh, tension in a more central fold, I think it is Mahashweta Devi. Mahashweta Devi's writings from the 1960s and 70s, if you note, uh, 60s and 70s mainly, mostly urban oriented because Devi hasn't still sort of departed. So what, what happens is that, so Haja Chura Shirma, one of the most iconic uh, writings by Devi or Mother of 1084, which has been translated and probably read uh, across India, is about the Naxalite movement and how um, a female, how Shujata, like this mother of uh, Broti, so deals with it on an everyday, on a daily basis, tries to find out why Broti was killed and how his, how her family responded to that. So that's Mahashweta's more of an arrival into the scene. And then she wrote a lot. And then in the 70s, late 70s, she decides to leave the urban setting, her residence and then uh, based entirely, located entirely in, in the margins, especially in Purulia, the uh, district of Purulia, in, and then also the state of Jharkhand with the tribal groups. He, she is a social activist and she has also uh, got uh, sort of founded a magazine called Bortika where she wrote about these things, uh, some of the challenges uh, facing the tribal population in India. And then she also, as, you, as we mostly know her, as a, a, a writer probably uh, one of the few extremely um, sort of capable writers to bring a topic of social crisis or uh, imagination to sort of a literary and artistic crisis. And that's why I think more work needs to be done on Mahashweta's more, sort of more of this ecologically, environmentally sort of oriented inclined writing, especially for my interest. So um, what is happening with Mahashweta is that um, from the 80s onward, her stories are dealing with the tribal uh, population and the tribal crisis. So, so we see Arun Nerodhikar coming. So that is on, on so right to forest. That is on the Birsa Munda, the Munda rebellion. Then we see Shalgira Dake to the call of Shalgira. That is the uh, sort of uh, the Shidukan, the Santal uh, rebellion. So one after another, what she is doing is she's showing two things very clearly. One is the ecological consciousness of the Adivasi people, the tribal population. If they are based in forests, they know how to respect forests because forests have originated, their, their myths of origin are intricately, organically associated with trees or forests or plants and their animals, of course. And the second part is, uh, is, is as I um, almost like uh, comes out from the first, is th the tribal mythology, the alternative ways of imagining India. Now, these two things have also made her internationally popular through the translations of Gayatri Chakravarti Spivak, especially that volume, Imaginary Maps. Now, I'd, uh, I'd just talk here about uh, Mahashweta because it's not a literary biography that I'm interested in right now to focus mainly on one story. It's called Mahadu Etti Rup Katha, Mahadu, a fairy tale. This was published uh, in 1994, I guess, but came out in where I took it from, in uh, the Sreshto Golpu, best stories or whatever you call it, uh, published uh, in 2007. And later on, I, I, was, uh, I was using a 2013 edition. This is from two, page 292 to 300. It, to my knowledge, the story hasn't still been translated, but the story is uh, absolutely, the story probably like clinches the point much more powerfully than any, any other story that I've come across. And to today, for today's discussion about body and literature, I think the story is very important as well. So what happens in this story is that Mahadu is, um, is a, so it is a story about the Korku tribe in Madhya Pradesh. The Korku tribes are uh, the tribal people, uh, sort of, um, that's how Mahashpeta actually presents it, uh, is that they, they are on the verge of extinction. And this is definitely a, a sort of an engendered tribe. The language and uh, the population is increasingly declining. And the language is also dying. It's a completely different language. And um, whatever I could gather of the tribe, um, so this is this comes from a from a paper uh, that I, I did a few years back. So whatever I could gather is that the government has been trying its best to um, sort of uh, you know uh, let's say give it quote unquote give it land and sort of uh, seeds and grain seeds etc to cultivate. But uh, according to um, if not Marsh, but then at least you can go on uh, YouTube and like Urku and there are a couple of documentaries. You'd see that they are doing all right uh, with the, they have sort of adapted to cultivation. That's what the documentary says. But Marsh Peter would rather say that they have not adopted. And I would imagine that 
somewhere down in, in between uh, lies the truth, I guess. So point here is that this story is about Mahadu, a Korku tribe. So Mahadu is a is a boy. Um, the story starts with um, the Mahadu being born. The story is of eight pages, at least from that book, and it's divided into nine parts. So to understand that the single part is not more than even a page. So these nine parts are um, the challenge, the linearity of the story. It's a non-linear story. So it starts with Mahadu being born and, um, and the struggles, uh, the struggle of Mahadu's mother sort of give birth to the child without having any medical uh, facilities around, right? And then it moves on from there, from this part two to part uh, Eight, it's all about how the state machineries of different kinds of state machineries, let's say state governmentality tools, and talk about governmentality a little more, tools have uh, been implemented by the state for, for instance, medical uh, personalities like doctors, and then there are laboratories, and then there are like public health departments, and then there are NGOs. They've all come, they've all sort of tried, and they've all sort of talked between them that the feet of the tribe, that they are not ready, they are not willing to live, they want to die. Uh, and throughout this uh, story, this, there is this increasing understanding that the tribe is not um, sort of adapting to our uh, modern uh, or sort of ultra-modern changes because the tribe doesn't want to live. Now, what happens so, uh, so from, as I said, part two to part eight is all about what is happening outside. And part, I think part eight is also um, the second half of it. Part eight is when Mahadu's story comes back. So you understand that Mahadu Ekti Rup Kotha, Mahadu a fairy tale, is not about Mahadu actually. 10% of the story is about Mahadu. So second part of uh, the penultimate part, the second half of it, Mahadu comes back. What, what happens is, now after all this, um, sort of what we have seen is that um, most of these uh, NGO bodies, after after trying hard, what they've decided, one of these two, of the two characters, suddenly there is a focus of two characters, so Shubhadra and Chintamoni, both of them are doctors or rather food specialists. Now, what they have done is that they also have connections with influential people and they also have a transnational network uh, with the Japanese scientists and US scientists. So what they do is they, uh, let's say, kidnap um, Mahadu and bring him to a laboratory in uh, Mumbai. This is a food laboratory and they want to... Uh, uh, sort of do an ex experiment on uh, Mahadu that if Mahadu is eaten properly, is sort of force fed, then would uh, he respond? Would his body respond? So what happens, we now see Mah Mahashwita's narrator tells us that there are different kinds of uh, saline and other drips on our body, on his body and uh, they see that Mahadu is actually willing to eat and he is eating and then we find that uh, Mahadu has also sort of um, opens his mouth, asks for water, and then suddenly they realize, so they're all very happy that the experiment has become successful. Then a day later, they realize that Mahadu is growing exponentially. Mahadu is going very fast. Now, uh, they, they measured him uh, and they also sort of uh, measured his weight, etc. And suddenly they see that it's a radical growth, right? And then the end of the story is about how Mahadu's, suddenly Mahadu's feet, they've grown so long that they sort of uh, blast through the through this sort of lab. And this is a 10 story building. And then Mahadu sits up from the bed and then decides to walk. And then what happens is he's so gigantic that the building uh, sort of uh, is raised down by, by, by the kind of um, power and energy that he has. And now Mahadu stands up and he starts eating. And he eats uh, first buildings and then Tata Memorial House, then this, uh, th there is a hotel that, and then finally he sees the Chhatrapati uh, Sivaji, that railway station. And a story, the story initially reminded us that these Korkus are dying because from the 1860s onward, the British started uh, systematically deforesting their, their location, as in like taking the Segun trees. The Segun trees are their tribe, the Shegu, their myth, their life, their origin revolves around the shagun trees. The shagun uh, leaves or the flowers, everything are sort of sacred for them. And when a Korku di dies, the mythology goes is that mm, their eyes show shagun flower and leaves. So 
these are the shagun trees which were sort of uprooted from their uh, location and they were used to start railways in mumbai first uh, thana to bombay i think and then thane to bombay and then from howrah to delhi etc so now that he's he looks at the railway station it starts eating the trains and then starts sort of scratching away and then sort of uprooting the railway tracks and then the final uh, part of it the episode the scene of it is that mahadev is uh, growing grown so tall that he can now stand with one of his legs uh, beneath uh, sort of the arabian sea and looking at the east and now he's turning towards the east he's going to come here and he is uh, as you can understand how gigantic he has become so this is where the story ends so mahadev ek roop ko is that that kind of fairy tale ending now as you can understand this is not a simple fairy tale right it's a very dark reading of fairy tale so my points here will be mostly two observations because i know that i've already taken uh, my sort of most amount of my time here so two observations here one is going to be about self starvation like uh, self starvation as a mode of resistance and the second part will deal with the strategy of it the aesthetics of it how mahashweta does it um in this particular story so let me um start with uh, this particular theoretical framework that i'm interested again and to share with you here so this is something that i wanted to share um and let me share the screen with you here so as you can understand before sharing the screen i just wanted to remind you that as you can understand and orc also talked at length about it that hunger is a very corporeal um the the corporeality the corporeal part of it is never uh, sacrificed when we talk about um he talked about death and i'm talking about uh, hunger and food crisis so in in writers hunger is often represented in an embodied aesthetics so the body the the bodily sort of responses are very important to represent that and the short story the framework the length of a short story not always allows you that amount of uh, introspection philosophical introspection philosophical corporeal introspection but uh, it also depends on how a writer chooses it nohashata definitely doesn't choose it to talk about the body throughout the story until the end because in a breath of eight pages she wanted to give us an understanding about historically what was going on so that we could sort of look at korku as well and doesn't look like and uh, it may not so mohashata or to us doesn't look like a far away wall that we are talking about it's very much us within it so what what she uh, does is he was an embodied aesthetics in the end so before i go there so here is a particular um reading that i'm interested um uh i'm not too sure if it will allow me but anyway i'll just read it out for you so this is by timothy winzen the aesthetics of hunger there is a uh, essay called the aesthetics of hunger not hamsum modernism and starvation's Go- global frame not hamsum is this norwegian writer who wrote this classic uh, novel called hunger so the, reading that novel timothy winzen writes and i quote him rather than map the systems that produce hunger hamsum filters the experience of starvation through a single first person narrator his experience takes place within a social context that hunger renders him incapable of interpreting the experience of hunger becomes a total one swamping his cognitive faculties in favor of bodily extremity the unnamed narrator's embodiment of hunger his refusal to take aid and suffer consequences and i quote again uh, make it clear that hunger in hamson's novel is neither a metaphor for a universal experience of modern anomy nor a proto existential investigation into human nature as critics tend to see it rather in foregrounding the bodily experience of hunger hamson situated the formal and thematic concerns of his novel within a developmental history of a nation's integration into the economic world system so this is a challenging reading for me so i unquote sorry i unquote so it's a challenging reading because hamson's novels uh, as i understand is called hunger deals with and it is about this particular art is the protagonist who decides not to take aid not to eat and through the bodily repercussions go through the challenges of poverty and hunger now for wind winds and um, sort of 
contra readings, which have all mostly talked about uh, the modernistic. And this novel was probably uh, in the 1887, in the 1880s it was published. So as you understand, much of the modernistic trends of writing are coming from Norwegian and Scandinavian countries. And would know about Ibsen and August Strindberg and others. So according to Vincent, so this is happening and we need to see hunger here in a social context and also how uh, the challenges for Hamson to deal with, to socially and thematically deal with hunger in this particular um, sort of novel. And he talks about this embodied aesthetics. I'd like to sort of bring it to uh, uh, the concept of self-starvation. Now, this is again a theoretical framework that I'm uh, sort of drawing from Maud Elman. And Maud Elman uh, wrote a book called The Hunger Artists, Starving, Writing, Imprisonment. It was published in 1993. And Orko probably knows about Maud Elman. She's also a psychoanalytic critic. So, uh, so here, um, about uh, the self, uh, sort of the phenomenon of self-starvation, Maud is writing in, in the beginning. Um, so, the, so the book is divided into four parts. I'm not going to in detail into that, but if you were interested into these um, aspects of starvation, body, anorexia, etc., anthropophagy, this is an excellent book, I think. So Elman's uh, interest is with the Irish hunger prote protests, or in general, the hunger protests. And we know about the hunger protests, right? So hunger, wh what is it that, that somebody would have to think about? So how does a hunger protest become a spectacle, become a protest itself, you know, sort of... Um, sort of an honor shown, right? Uh, and this is something that he writes, that she writes in the beginning. So she deals, as I said, with the Irish uh, protest images. So in the context of these images, and I quote from uh, Elman's book, in the context of these images, it is impossible to know exactly why the hunger striker of Arma destroyed herself or what her self-starvation meant to her. But even she died of sheer despair, her hunger was a form of speech. And speech is necessarily a dialogue whose meanings do not end with the intentions of the speaker, but depend upon the understanding of the interlocutor. Her body was enmeshed in social codes that preceded and outdated its brief consciousness. In particular, it was entangled in the, in the rival ideologies of nation, gender, and religion, and racked by all their passionate intensities. It was in the form of hunger that these forced battled that these forces battled for expression, ravaging the very flesh on which they were inscribed. Unquote. So this, when I was reading it uh, during my PhD work, etc., when I was reading it, it reminded me again of Mahashweta Devi. If you know about the story Spandaini, the breast giver, and Doloti the bountiful, and then again, uh, you know. Dopti Mejan, story after story, Mohashweta probably encoded uh, in her characters, in her, the body of her characters, uh, the different kinds of social expressions of religion, nation, and marginality, right? I'd also quote this other part from her book, which probably will set the theoretical framework strong enough for the final observations on this story. So I quote her again. In the context, uh, right, sorry, uh, here, again. So. I just like bring it back. Right. So again, so what happens is uh, just I'm just looking at time as well. Um, the, for me, what is happening here is that throughout the story, the characters, the protagonists are saying that they are, as I said, they do not want to live. That's why they are dying. So for me, there is a case of self-starvation or rather a social collective self-starvation going on as a mode of resistance, that they're resisting to the modernization and the systemic deprivation and the deforestation, they're because their religion has been sacralized by uprooting those trees uh, through uh, sort of revolving uh, their life around them. So, so that's the kind of reading that comes out from Mahashwetas, uh, or at least the, the characters who are dealing with it, or rather the protagonists, apart from Mahadu. But it is not entirely Correct. And Mahashwita's narrator also tells us that um, they, they want to live, right? Who wants to die? They want to live and they want to go back to, and they, they still hunt, they are still hunter gatherers. They do cultivation, they do a bit of uh, commercial selling as well. And uh, we know, we get to know that Mahadu's mother sells. Uh, sort of uh, ribbons, sells, sort of makes things out of the forest products. So, uh, as I said, in between these two interpretations, 
Mahashweta continues to give us a mainstream interpretation that, okay, we tried a lot, they're not ready to live. And then there is another interpretation coming from probably living ethnographically with the foresters that, of course, there is an organic life going there and nobody wants to die in this life. It's just that they're not getting enough support. So what we get gathered here is that one is a reading of uh, sort of uh, extinction towards extinction, self-starvation. Another is there are tools of governmentality. As I said, governmentality is again a Foucauldian biopolitical term. It's, it means that how different tools, like how a state exercises its power through different tools, different mechanisms, which are not always hardcore institutional. So a non-governmental organization also has that now name government in it, that means they have the procedures and the process uh, and the systems that replicate governmental structures, right? So it could be a non-governmental organization, could be public health departments, could be entirely like voluntary, etc. How these organizations have tried to make their contribution and probably mostly failed, at least in the context of the story. And how is uh, the core who self uh, sort of resisting to self-starvation? These are the two things dominantly coming out. But then why is it something that I find challenging is because of the ending. And that's my final observations. The ending part of it is very interesting. What happens here is, as I said, uh, that uh, Mahadu grows gigantic, like the corpse in Amity, which was growing uh, in the other room. And I think Madeline or whatever, like the lover and the, the characters didn't have any understanding what to do with the corpse. And then when they, uh, I think the story, like the, the, the play ends with when sort of they finally um, engrave him, the corpse sort of escapes. And uh, it, this was just by the river and the corpse floats into, uh, sort of floats, sort of swims in the river. It's very um, sort of, um, let's say, in a more... Um, commonplace sense, absolute, right? So this is what Ionesco and others were dealing with. But here, again, we see the corpse is growing up and the single sentence that, or couple of sentences, but the single meaning of it is that I am, so the corpse, that is Mahadu, what Mahadu says when he uh, sort of sits up, I am hungry, feed me. I am hungry, feed me. He repeats this, these things, give me food. And whatever he gets, he eats. Uh, and then the final bit of it, right, about uh, sort of eating uh, in a symbolic fashion, the railways. Now, again, as I said, the colonialism, colonial part of it, the British railways, the modernization part of it is very clear. The post-colonial part of it, the governmentality and the tools, how uh, a government is trying to deal with uh, by, by not, by sort of taking control of hunger is actually worsening the situation for a tribe in various ways. And the other card deaths are an example. So this is another way of dealing with it. Now, what Mahashweta does is that, of course, there is, uh, the story doesn't end like that, right? Probably Mahadu dies in a more realistic fashion. But Mahashweta wants to give the Korku tribe, a, let's say an example or an instance of hope. And in order to do that, what she does is she gives us a fairy tale ending that somebody is growing up. And in each, in, uh, when you read the story, it might remind you of uh, kind of a, something that Mikhail Bakhtin, the Russian critic, called a grotesque realism. Like somebody who is growing up, like Pentag, like Rabelais in, in his world, he talked about uh, this sort of comic art, um, satirical comic art, the grotesque part of it. But again, it is uh, one of the things that is so endemic or so characteristic of grotesque and grotesque made realism is uh, the comical part of it, right? Uh, the, the, the kind of uh, satirical part of it. In this particular study, I don't really think I found any comical relief. Yeah, if you want to think about Mahadu growing up as a comical relief, of course, you can always draw from that. But I was also thinking about the thing that Mahadu says, I'm hungry, give me food, doesn't allow me to take that relief, right? So in that sense, Mahashweta is giving, again, as I said, a dark rendering of the fairy tale and also not entirely a grotesque rendering of realism. It is probably from within realism because the story, actually, the story, I mean, if I give you the, as I give you the content, is about deprivation and systemic sort of um, discrimination and deforestation. But she has given us a part story. The non-linear part of it was clearly an agenda for her, that these are the things, and, and this is what uh, Devi says, that these are the tools that um, that have been implemented that, uh, to sort of take care of the hunger issue. And they have had their own interpretation. It's just that the mainland continues to impose interpretation on the margins and doesn't listen to the margins in a sustained manner. Sympathy, empathy is a different thing. In a sustained manner, the, the absolute dismantling of 
the very human process of listening to it and that's that's uh, something that she uh, and i'll just give you another quote from um, boshai tudu another operation boshai tudu was it as another sort of novella in the 1970s and that's what she says in in that story the narrator says and i quote but one would lose boshai if one refused to listen to what he had to say or didn't care to understand what he said and then without having understood him when one tried to present him conveniently for the records as something different from what he really was who would be the loser boshai tudu or the new interpreters where would the research analysts of the future who would salvage the truth from the mountains of untruths and the set and set the uh, record straight there were too many truths in the world distorted into lies in the records through the conspiracy of the administration isn't there daily assassination of truths going on continuously unquote so because as doing this as mostly doing a reading of this story in my phd thesis and i'm interested in mohasbeta broadly this comes back again to this story reading of the story mahadu that there are always and there is another story i can tell you about shishu children there is always this presence of the research analysts like uh, who come with a lot of data and this is probably coming out and i'm not probably probably this is uh, i think coming out of mohasbeta's everyday experience of witnessing uh, sort of the state sending armies of research analysts uh, or the non governmental organizations sending and trying to make data out of it and trying to make sure that you know the world knows about them but nothing happens over year after now so that's what was with us probably very impassioned plea that listen to them and step step aside from the research part uh, you know just be there and then find out what is going wrong in order to understand that in a sustained fashion you have to give it time like know how they work right and this is also something that is not working in the story mahadu that we do not know exactly from the story what will work for them we have just been imposing things on them and that's in order to show that i think for me for my reading in order to show that i think mahashweta then finally has to take a particular strategy so giving us this part glimpses into how the state machinery work has to get into this final bit where she shows um, she sort of exceeds realism right the real is the the most realistic part of it the everyday part of it suddenly escapes and we now see that we hardly imagine what to do so right so it was a very deliberate ploy on the part uh, of the writer to give mahadu a mythological ending something that probably the korku tribe knows about right we do not know entirely in the on the basis of probability probability so what happens in the end this kind of a this kind of an expansion of reality of the way we cognize things to me is always has always been a realist sort of feature it it doesn't you do not need to go into uh, even if you talk about grotesque and realism or magic or realism they are not away from the term realism right because we continue to ask questions that you know hamlet also asked truth is stranger than fiction these parts will happen probably in a memoriatic in a memory in a collective memory uh, manner so what 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 we see in the end and these are my final words what we see in the end in this particular story is a challenge that mohashwita throws at us that this might be true this is a dialectic going on that there is a utopian hope for the korku tribe that a korku figure such as mahadu will come up and says and do something there is a hope for that but it might not happen as well that is the tragic part of it right so finally the there is in this particular dialectic of tragedy and utopia lies uh, sort of the depiction of hunger in realism i believe and that's precisely where i think mahashweta's role is key that she tried to project a crisis of food crisis or food security or hunger in a, in a historical framework and also in an aesthetic framework to give us an understanding of what it means to have an embodied aesthetics of hunger and food crisis and in order to do so she has to sort of wrestle with wrench the conventionalities the conventional tools of realistic story writing and that's where i believe if we think about taking hunger or food crisis as an organizing artistic principle these some of these stories might be you know key for our for our for our, or some of these readings might help us um, sort of get to the get to some get to this point so i'll just stop here and uh, i'll get talk about other things when if, if there are uh, discussions relating to that okay i'll stop here to my presentation thank you thank you uh, thank you shorida uh, thank you for this wonderful session uh, we have been informed about at length uh, 
post-colonial history, literature, as well as politics. Uh, there are some a few questions on, on me. Uh, the very first question is asking by, asked by uh, Uttam Banerjee. He's asking, in the film Gupi Gain Bhagavan, where we see hunger and poverty is casted in a funny manner. Yeah. And as you say, it is sentimentalized rather hunger is a trap to bring harmony in kingdom as well as hunger is in punishment. So are there other examples where hunger is used in such a way? Right. That's a great question. Thank you for that. Uh, if you, I mean, if you have seen, um, uh, this is a, this is for the audience that um, Gupi Gain Bhagavan uh, is about a village like Horitoki and Amlohi, if I remember. Uh, look at the terms, right? These are all three names, the villages, and uh, they they do not know how to secure their food, Gupi and Bagha. And if you remember, um, when they want food, what they eat is a huge, like ornate amount of a meal, like by the by the, by a river or by somewhere. They're eating like with fish, with maybe like you know um, meat, with uh, eggs, with sort of sweet meats, etc. So we do not have this kind of a meal on a daily basis. So somewhere down the line, there is a projection throughout that you know, like that the craving for it, that I have been poor and I have been sort of deprived of certain amenities throughout my life. So when I eat, it will be a spectacle. So in, in that sense, I mean, this is something that I want you to remember uh, from this, how are they projecting the, the, the element of food? In the, and is there a political statement going on in those projections? Then you'll probably see from those statements or implied messages, what is going on in the particular era where somebody is filming about that. So, Upendra Kishore or anybody who has been writing about these tales in the 19, and 20 might have thought about it in a different way. And that's that's the that's what I keep saying. This is an investigative artistic principle. You can get an understanding of the age and some of these challenges of writing a story through these tiny minor details in a more micro historical manner. Okay, uh, there is a second part of his question too. Uh, He's asking, are yeah, there any doc yeah, sure. Uh, are there any documentaries on hunger and partition and the condition right. of refugee and hunger? Yes, uh, I, th I mean, like there are documentary itself has not been widely um, publicized, right? So the documentaries that have come and it has not been, and that's the challenge we Indians and Bengalis have that we do not preserve our historical documents well enough or um, we have not given, uh, we don't even have a partition museum as yet, right? So we have, let alone uh, a 1943 Bengal famine and commemoration of that. Look at Ireland. Ireland, uh, the Great Famine, if you come to Ireland, if you go visit Dublin and every other, like, you know, Cork and other parts have uh, sort of stretched statues and monuments of people walking, like, uh, you know, in, in a process, in a procession. So that's something that I'm missing. But of course, I've come across a couple of documentaries that are dealing with the partition uh, because of the recent um, sort of uh, initiatives taken by a couple of organizations. They're all, they're about partition and the trauma and the tragedy and the absolute chaos uh, of migration during partition. And as you can understand, would it not be an everyday aspect? Uh, how do you secure food in a situation where you were working for three days, right? And this is something also um, about uh, the Bengal famine. People are walking and most of these novels are about people walking and managing to forage for food, foraging for food. So. Partition would, of course, a documentary on partition. The pro problem with, the, with, with with this kind of a perspective is that partition part will overshadow every other part. So that is uh, the, the trauma and the tragedy of people migrating. And that's something we have to remember if we want to use um, a topic that is every day on yet has not been given a sustained uh, literary or critical treatment is how in those moments for three or four minutes, uh, the documentary, uh, the, you know, the, the sort of the artist, let's say, uh, the document. So the artist is trying to focus on these people. What are they doing? How are they sort of responding to the situation? And these tell a lot about, uh, you know, we talk about the migrant crisis in India. Uh, 
could we not talk could we at all talk about the migrant crisis without the kind of food and the food imagery that were around especially those of chapatis and rotis on the railway tracks so think about that like how do we respond it might in, like invoke an uh, emotional sensational response straight away and then might just stop disappear well, how do we represent the everyday of hunger in that sense so just to be short yeah there are uh, in these two documentaries there are moments of that okay um thank you shorid uh, there is another question nilanjana ray is asking for uh, suggesting some critical readings on hunger and representation and its representation right so hunger and its representation has been um has been a recent um, let's say research project or agent i mean it's not that it has not been there for a period like as i said mod elmens book was published in 1993 uh, it is called the hunger artist but more recently the issues of food security hunger food crisis have come within the domain of what we know as environmental humanities where uh, historians philosophers food scientists cultural critics literary uh, writers they're working together to understand uh, not only the historical bit of it like what happened in the 1940s or 60s in any part of the world um, but again like this kind of what is happening right now and uh, there is a global food crisis happening right now as well as the so water crisis and these things are happening because of a larger understanding of a larger phenomenon of global warming now uh, in the last maybe like a decade or so i've come across at least three uh, works which are dealing with as i said timothy winsen's article on uh, hunger and aesthetics was published i think in 2017 then alice moody has written um, a book on aesthetics of hunger in modernist works which was published in 2018 or 19 probably 2019 um alice is also has also worked on beckett so all you might know about alice already and the other book that have come across recently is something that i've also written in is uh, an edited volume on the aesthetics and politics of global hunger or people have talked about the representation of hunger on a global framework so this, these works might be useful for you and I, for 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 getting a framework but the challenges of it for me working in this area with not a lot of theoretical framework quality is that to the challenge is to not sort of to, to to sort of build a framework drawing from existing frameworks right so you draw from different frameworks and you make a mixed methodology and try to make a framework which will allow you to investigate into a culture or a literature through a uh, um, let's say a methodology and for me it's a materialistic framework so it might be something else such as a psychoanalytic framework for mod elman and others so um, so th this works might be helpful yeah okay um now mohammad siddiq uh, it's a kind of observation of him uh, he is asking does hunger and death mean the same for the human body should a person be afraid of hunger more than uh, death today and uh, which is observed in our society nowadays yeah now that's the thing is that um i think orko is a better uh, in a better is in a better position to talk about drives and death and what kind of uh makes us more uh, scared right but uh these are i mean like uh we can expect to me the short answer would be we can experience hunger but can we experience death we could probably experience a death like situation in um in a particular you know unfortunate instance maybe like an accident or something like that so a death like you know people say just mrittur mukh theke beche firlam just just from the mouth of let's say in a more a literal sense the mouth of death from the verges of death from the claws of death so uh, this is the probably the closest we can get about death but um, probably as i said many of us have gone through periods of hunger sometimes on a daily basis sometimes on a sustained basis right so and that's where it makes us so scared that after a bit and in most of these stories dealing with hunger most of the uh, fiction dealing with hunger we talk about that after a point your body resigns Uh, whether you die or not and people do die right that's why the statistics show whether you die or not is a second question is that the body resigns your body cannot respond at all and uh, what happened to mahadu in this particular fairy tale was probably he died with an overdose of food and that's the other part of it that had to be shown 
to uh, to the literary and the public world that he didn't die he actually grew bigger and he wanted to make a case of resistance out of it right so that that could be my response to that okay uh, there is another question from our uh, professor dr sesh sholkar hod of our history department she is asking uh, can you throw some light on the gendered notion of hunger yes of course thank you so much and um, as you can understand that here even in this story <clears throat> hunger is always gendered right uh, uh, in 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 mahadwiti rupakatha for instance the mother is hungry and then the child is hungry but more often than not we see that women are dying of hunger the statistical surveys would show uh, more than men and i'm talking about men when talking about men adult men women and children mostly children try and women so if we think about the body and if we think about how gendered our bodies are from the uh, moment we realize we we start cognizing this world and you know there have been i mean we know about this how bodies become gendered then we also realize that having to fetch for our for our food is also broadly dependent on who works and who doesn't right so it's about labor if a man is in control of the family and going out then he and he gets like the daily sort of support like the daily wage etc then he has actually got those cash and can i decide to feed his family or decide to feed himself and as i said gender dimension of labor is very important if more and more female workers are out more and more women are out on a daily basis as a daily wage worker and that's why the, the governments have come out with the ongonari and different kinds of you know female organizations that are encouraging female participants in labor then you have the cash on your hand and then you can also choose whether to invest it into a family or to actually at this point of time feed you and make you alive and that's why i, I thought that because of the continuous uh controlling of labor by uh, the male in india or probably global everywhere because of the kind of history that we have grown up with and again colonialism does have a very strong role in that in how we how gendered our histories are because the laws are also gendered so the question of hunger becomes also very gendered to me to my observations i, I cannot give you like sustained discussions but elise moody's work does talk about gender and hunger so that could be uh, a way but to me at this point of time of course hunger is gendered okay uh, there is an interesting question from sneha mondal uh, sneha mondal she is asking that the uh, case of sharmila chanu has been called the world's longest hunger strike so uh, now can hunger strikes affect indian politics yeah i think it's a great question as well so i think uh, i mean like these are these are things to think about before thinking about hunger in culture that how does one make sense of their body in crisis how does one make a politics out of a body so when uh, we were, i mean i was in my um, maybe in my grad undergrad or postgrad is an anna hazare went on strike right hunger strike in delhi and so many of you might know about that already this goes back to uh the hunger strikes in india during india's independence struggle like gandhi's hunger strike the fast then you would know that a uh, number of um revolutionary figures such as bhagat singh and others would go uh would be imprisoned and they would refuse to eat and they would really struggle hard not to be eaten as if the state is force feeding you and you are not eating is a resistance to the state's control of your body something that all course talked about that the biopolitical control of your body so these and uh, mort elmen does talk about this politics out of the body uh, in the cause of nationalist like collective or individual case somebody might just be out there with a flag and an agenda and sit and just say that i'm dying i'm i'm, I'm on a hunger strike now here now if it comes to let's say after independence comes there are two directions we have seen one is like the one that anna hazare took it's more of a in the mainland of delhi in the capital of it which draws a lot of public attention hazare has a non violent gandhian politics to bear upon as well so 
that's the kind of politics we're dealing with which even if you don't want you have to know and then there is and this was about you know uh, sort of about corruption right mostly and then there is the other one of sharvila chanu and then iram sharvila as well i think iram sharvila from the uh, manipur and some the from from, from the let's like, north eastern bales right to go through uh through 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 body the bodily pain and to make a spectacle um out of it that i am resisting to let's say the indian state right now here after colonialism you can't actually stay stand or sit on a hunger strike against a force that is colonizing right right but for people for populations in the frontier states in the marginal states in the states where the culture language mode of life are way different from what we call about the mainland state and that's precisely has been mahashwetas interest as well that the mainland does not understand the margin precisely because they do not understand how they talk how they work what is their life so here is somebody again taking the same image same uh, political means of doing of making a spectacle out of her body and showing to the world that i am resisting precisely because of a cause a cause about my gender about my people about my fellow citizens and about people that the indian state of which i am part of my um, indian government which my state is part of has not been cognizant of this thing or rather has been uh, unmindful right about the tactics that they have used so this is something that i'm thinking about here that again hunger strike goes far back and it is it was a means used by the irish as an anti colonial strategy which then came through the irish revolutionary movement ira and the irish revolutionary movements in the 1910 27 1917, 1917 especially the easter strikes through that to the home rule demands to india especially through gandhi and then from there to the revolutionaries and then throughout this is a non violent means of striking you are not actually harming anybody you are harming your own body but by doing that you are making a spectacle out of it and that is shaming the entire population and shaming the citizens so that's something that i'm thinking about that this politics has a long historical lineage and a strong anti colonial dimension of it an anti imperialist dimension of it so that and that's very gendered uh, in the way that iram sharmila also um, sort of does it through the in the case of manipur so that we need to remind remind ourselves that this is a politics this is a statement and when somebody writes about does the statement through their body it becomes a political statement a, a, a politics a direct political intervention with a rival and here for formula and others the rival is the indian state so that's something we need to think about okay uh, now we'll take some selective two three questions from youtube comment section uh, go of the <laughs> could you please see if there is any question Yes, uh, Gorobda, are you there? Hello? Yeah, we can yeah. hear you. Am I audible? Yeah. Okay. So I'll, I'll first of all, uh, uh, I could not actually get time to thank personally uh, Orkoda. So I am actually thanking both of you for such wonderful sessions. Both of the sessions were very insightful. I'm just going to very quickly uh, gloss through the. Uh, comment box here there are a couple of questions one of the questions was asked <clears throat> uh, very early in the session during shorida uh, shorida session it was by razina mustafa she is asking uh, how is hunger politicized uh, when food becomes a norm of dissent and discrimination how can food become a part of power politics yeah again that's a great question <clears throat> food uh, you know the, the how to, how do we secure food we never ask these questions beyond the question of whether our parents or whether we have money so money and food has a direct relationship do we have money okay i can buy food that's the commodity relationship right the exchange relationship uh, one against the other here the question is what happens if we do not if we run out of money what is it that we are then fighting for then food goes out do we have other means to secure food do we grow our own food 
uh, these are things that come back to us when we are put into the crisis. Now think about this crisis from a situation, especially I'm, I'm, uh, it will be um, wrong on my part if I say that I am going through this situation. No, at all. I'm reading this situation. So I am uh, very privileged to be able to talk about these situations in a critical fashion. But I see that writers and uh, critics are dealing with it on a daily basis. They're writing about that. And then I try to think in a vicarious manner that what happens in that in that, uh, in that that particular, when somebody does not know how to secure food, that's the question about food security comes in. And what are the means that the government, governments have to take and how do they come to the public imagination? We do, I don't even know like which policies are out. I'm sure many of us do not know which policies, food policies are out to take care of these situations in the margins. It's just that until and unless people like us who are interested in writing in 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 broadly speaking writing per se we do not write about these things in a lay and accessible language to a broader population then we do not need know what is happening around right so what happens is we do not know how the banks work we just know that we can take money if a banker doesn't write about what is going on on an everyday basis during the covid crisis we do not know that bank is even a subjective or personalized world we always see it as an objective world where relation exchanges are taking place so of course food and food security are a very strong domain. It's just that we as lay citizens, and by lay citizens, I mean, I think 90% of India uh, will be lay citizens when it comes to policies about food and food security. We, when we do not know about these things, our politics becomes a politics of emotion which is very important, of course. We are trying to, we are sympathizing, we are empathizing, we are evoking a lot of rage. We are sort of uh, outrageous about certain things. How could somebody die because of not having other card? But it stops there. If, it, if food needs to become a part of our sustained political project, then it needs to be out in the public, in their language, in an image that we can relate to. And that is probably part that falls on our part, especially if people specializing in the writing departments. If we do not do that, Policy writers and scientists would never be able to do that because they do not have the training. Okay, thank you. Uh, there are all, uh, I mean, there are a couple of questions which actually have you have already answered in uh, one way or the other. Uh, there's one particular question by Shumantra Boral, uh, who is asking, other than realist narratives, both in literature and in visual arts, is there any other mode of representation that can do justice to its subject, such as hunger, poverty, or famine. Yeah, um, when we, I mean, this is about literature, right? So when it, when we are talking about literature today in the 21st century, especially in the second decade of the 21st century, we're talking about literature in a broad sense. Today, literature is about uh, can can talk bridge the verbal and the visual. It also can be uh, the performative, right? So. Beyond, let's say, the verbal and the visual, I've seen plenty of enactment of uh, the food crisis situations in theater and uh, pantomime and sort of performative art. And I've seen uh, representations of this in fine art, right? Uh, and in crafts, in the way that people mold, use their clay and mold shapes. Uh, those shapes may say a lot, may give us a lot of message about how a particular tribe who has built those models what kind of message they're trying to put across. So, uh, this, I mean, for me, I'm not trained to talk critically about or meaningfully about clay art or maybe uh, performative art. I'm mostly trained in literary and cultural works. And broadly, these are all cultural, but I do not have the direct training. Point being, but it doesn't need a direct training for somebody who is dealing with literature and art for a period of time. You, ca you can... you you probably would have come across a situation or an instance in literature where somebody is talking about a clay art based model or uh, sort of shapes and faces. So it, it probably, and, and, and uh, Maud Elvin is talking about graffiti, about pamphlets, about leaflets where hunger strikes have been. So I think we, in the last couple of decades, to my knowledge, we have broadened what could be part of literature and what um, is part of literature. And people are dealing with much more mixed methodological arguments. I've seen extremely well-written sort of uh, MA papers, MA term papers, or thesis or dissertation on graffiti and uh, sort of uh, pamphlets. So point being, we, we might have to then take cognition of what do we see on the walls or on other parts or in, and could they say uh, could they give us a message in lay terms if they're giving us a message that's art 
if they're giving us uh, indirect message, that's even a better art. That's how we have been trained to think about, right? So these are all part of uh, the way that we uh, exercise or we, uh, let's say, observe our life on a daily basis. If they're part and parcel of it, if people are still doing them, putting banners and sh selling or uh, distributing leaflets, they mean something to us still, right? So that could also be brought into the fold of literary discourses and discussions. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Shoidha. Uh, my apology to the other participants. We, we just cannot take all those questions. Uh, now we have finally come to end of this uh, webinar. Uh, now may I request uh, to the coordinator um, of IQAC, KK Dash College, Dr. Nashima Munshi, to extend her vote of thanks. Over to you, Nashima. Thank you, Animesh. Good evening, everyone. Am I audible? Yeah, you're audible. Please go ahead. Good evening, everyone. It's been a very fascinating and very engaging afternoon today. As a coordinator of this webinar and also the coordinator of IQAC of this college, I feel honored and privileged to propose vote of thanks on this occasion. First of all, I would like to extend a very hearty vote of thanks to our most valued invited speakers, Dr. Orko Chattopadhyay, Assistant Professor, Department of Humanities and Social Science, IIT Gandhinagar, and Dr. Shurit Bhattacharya, Lecturer in Post-Colonial Studies, University of Glasgow, for their insightful and informative talks on body and literature. Thank you speakers for arranging time for us and enriching us by your wonderful talks. We hope that we would listen to you again in another occasion at our college. My heartfelt thanks to our respected participants who are here with us have listened patiently to our speakers, ask their important questions and made both the session enjoyable. We are blessed to have our principal sir as our guide in every occasion. Thank you, sir. Now a big thanks to our Department of English, especially to my colleague Animesh Bhak, Assistant Professor of English and the convener of today's webinar. We would Look forward to you and your team for more future endeavors. A special thanks to Mridul Kanti Bhomik and Polomi Pal, Faculty of Computer Science, for their technical support. Without their relentless effort, it could not be possible to conduct the webinar smoothly. I also thankful to our entire team KKDC for their precious support. Once again, thank you all participants. Hoping the same response from your side for future webinar. Thank you all. Over to Animesh. Okay. So okay. Uh, there yeah. we end. And finally, again, thanks to the, all the participants and thanks to our eminent speakers. Uh, thanks to my colleague, Gaurabda. Uh, thank you. Thank you again. Thank you so much.